Okay. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the February 7, 2023 Board of Education meeting. <clears throat> Excuse me. Please take notice that this public meeting, the Sayreville Board of Education, was transmitted to the Home News Tribune in the Star Ledger in accordance with Chapter 231, PL Law 1975, further in accordance with NJSA 10-4-6-21. A copy of this notice was posted outside the board secretary's office, and a copy was also filed with the clerk of the borough of Sayreville. <clears throat> Please rise to salute the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Oh, oh. everybody can everybody <clears throat> continue to Stand. Yes, uh, at this time we'd have a, Mr. Fernandez would like to have a moment of silence for uh, one of our council women who unfortunately uh, is no longer with us. Mr. Fernandez, would you like to uh, take it over? Thank you, Mr. President. On behalf of myself, the council, and our community, I'd like to extend our deepest sympathies to the family of Eunice, Councilwoman Eunice Yumpor, especially her young daughter. There are no words that can express the immense sense of loss we are all experiencing. By all accounts, she was a loving and caring person who positively impacted the lives of many individuals. Although never as much as to, to her family, her loss is shared by our community, the state, and the nation, as we have lost a bright and talented public servant and role model. Ms. Doomfor was a symbol of the American dream. Like many of us, her parents immigrated to, the, to this country in search of a better life. Ms. Jumfor graduated Weequick High School in Newark and later moved to Sayreville. As a woman of color, first generation, a single mother, she rose at a young age to, to join our council with a bright future in front of her. Our hearts go out to her family and her friends, and our prayers are with law, are the brave individuals of law enforcement that they're able to find the individuals who did this and bring them to justice. Thank you. And we ask that we remain silent. Thank you, Mr. Fernandez. Also, uh, Ms. Bloom, would you like to say a few uh, words? Yes, <coughs> it is my sad uh, duty to report that we have lost another one of our Sayreville family. <clears throat> John Tutella, who taught music for many years at the Truman School. Sadly passed away yesterday unexpectedly. John was only 61 years old. I can remember as union president when I would visit Truman and I would always go into John's room and he was always happy to see me, which wasn't always the case. <coughs> and he would have his little ones sing some little ditty just to put a smile on my face. He was a kind and loving man and he will be truly missed. Thank you. Please. <coughs> me. Mrs. Bloom? Here. Mr. Callahan? Here. Mr. Fernandez? Here. Mrs. Napolitano? Here. Mrs. Pavone? Here. Ms. Pylock? Here. Mr. Smith? Here. Mr. Walsh? Here. And Mr. Esposito? Here. Can you please uh, summarize executive session for us, Ms. Hill? The board discussed personnel, including but not limited to agenda items and student matters. Thank you. I don't believe there's any correspondence to speak of, um, so can I please have a motion to approve the minutes from our regular and executive uh, sessions for January 17th meeting? So moved. Second. Mrs. Pabone? Uh, Mr. Smith, you got it. Roll call, please. Mrs. Bloom? Yes. Mr. Callahan? Yes. Mr. Fernandez? Yes. Mrs. Napolitano? Yes. Mrs. Pabone? Yes. Ms. Pylock? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Mr. Walsh? Yes. And Mr. Esposito? Yes. Thank you. Okay, at this time, you guys are up. Ms. Pesci, you wanna tell us what you, uh, tell us what you have? Sure. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Board of Education members and administrators. I'm Gianna Pesci and I'm the SWMHS Student Council Board of Education representative. I would first like to start off with extracurricular activities. 
I would like to congratulate these following art students who were selected to show their paintings and drawings in the 13th annual exhibition at the Sally D. Francisco Gallery in Layton, New Jersey on February 4th, 2023. Alexander Almo, Anaya Siraj, Dia Bawa, Isabella Colazzo, and Trishel Afahini. Also, out of these four students, Isabella's painting received an honorable mention from the <coughs> annual Scholastic Art and Writing Awards. It was one of over 2,000 pieces of art. I would also like to congratulate student musician Richard Kuzma, who was recently selected to be a member of the 2023 NJ All-State Band. They will perform in Atlantic City on February 23rd and 24th. Student Council ran the freshman tip-off where 8th grade students and their parents or guardians attended to see what high school sports and clubs they can join. The students from SWMHS were representing their clubs and sports at a table by explaining the fun and exciting things you would be able to sign up for. After their time was done in the cafeteria viewing the activities, students attended the boys basketball game in the gym for free, as their parents or guardians attended an orientation in the auditorium. Heroes and Cool Kids vis visited the UES fifth grade students to share their positive messages and lessons with them. The UES students were also able to ask questions to us high schoolers about what it's like to be in high school or about our experiences that contribute to our lessons. Our FBLA and DECA students are preparing and getting excited for the Atlantic City trip in the beginning of March. Good luck to all of you who are going. Mr. Alvarez's Robotics class participated in the annual Robotic Road Rally Challenge, where students designed and built robots to complete a timed obstacle course. In Project Before, our Tomorrow Teachers program visited the Selvers School to work with preschool staff and students. They had many lesson plans and activities, and loved spending time with them. Lastly, I would like to just say congratulations to all January students of the month. Now for athletic, athletics at the high school. The girls' swim record is now 4-4 four four this season. The boys' swim record is now 4-3 and three this season with wins over Woodbridge, Monroe, Monroe Piscataway, and North Brunswick. The girls' bowling record is now 2-12 and 12 with wins over East Brunswick and Monroe. The boys' bowling record is now 0-17. The boys' basketball record is now 5-18 and 18 with wins over Christian Calvary, Long Branch, North Plainfield, New Brunswick, and East Brunswick Magnet. The girls' basketball record is now 0-24. The wrestling record is now 15 and 10 with wins over South Brunswick, Madawan, twice at New Providence, Bayonne, Perth Amboy, Edison, Monmouth, Spotswood, Piscataway, Kenelon, Monroe, Metuchen, Notre Dame, East Brunswick, and Carteret. The boys and girls winter track teams are also doing very well this season and now have state sectionals this upcoming Saturday. Lastly, I would like to congratulate the cheer team for placing first in the all music and game day division at the impact competition this past weekend. With that being said, have a great rest of your night and thank you for your time. Thank you, thank you. Excellent job thank as you. always. Thank you. Um, I left the game early Saturday, five minutes early. Did we do anything? What'd they do? The Which boys, game? right? Did the boys play Saturday? I can't remember. Were you the girls game or the boys game? What did I see? I if it was, was the GMCs, they won. There was somebody playing Saturday. Was at the game. Didn't the girls play in the morning? <laughs> I can't remember. <laughs> What's your team? You gotta tell me these things. I rely on you each week to give me updates. All right. No, I know who I was. I know who won. Okay, I'm done. Gianna, I'm done did you abuse. did you go? Uh, were you representing any of the clubs or activities during um, freshman tip off? Yeah, student council. The, oh right. Yeah. Did a lot of kids come and visit you? Yeah, there were a lot, and it was more than expected. Fantastic. Great. Any questions from especially? Good job. Thank you. Outstanding as always. Thank you. Ms. Kuntz, you're up. Good evening, Board of Education members and administrators. My name is Morgan Kuntz, SMS Student Council Board of Education representative. I would like to begin with the Community Service Club. The Community Service Club sent letters to homebound seniors. They also prepared flyers for our Sammy's Hope Animal Shelter collection. They are currently collecting food, towels, and blankets for the animal shelter. On March 24th, PTO will be hosting a designer handbag bingo and tricky tray event. This is the largest fundraiser for the PTO. Tickets can be purchased by visiting our website at www.mysmspto.com. On March 29th, the PTO is partnering with the school to host a family literacy night. The student council will be selling carnations during lunch for Valentine's Day. The proceeds will be going towards Imagine, which is the NJASC charity. This organization assists children and adults with grief counseling. 
On February 2nd, 15 eighth grade representatives attended the Path to Leadership Conference sponsored by the New Jersey State Elks Association. The students volunteered throughout the keynote speaker's presentation and learned how to deal with stress and anxiety in situations. The morning was filled with lots of laughs and learning. In the afternoon, the students listened to the Ocean County Prosecutor's Office present information about vaping and online predators. SMS Class Council held February socials for 6th, 7th, and 8th. Students were treated to music by our very own DJ Jarrett Lampkin, who played games and purchased snacks. All money made will go directly to the student activities accounts. Class Council is also working with the Community Service Club for this month's class competition. The grade level who brings in the most pet food will receive 100 points toward their class competition total. Now onto the Cerebral Middle School Sports. Both competition teams, Game Day and All Music, will be competing at their first competition on February 18th at Howell High School. The cheerleading team is selling clothing online. Please consider updating your bomber wardrobe for the spring. The girls basketball team. The girls middle school basketball program continues to improve each week. They have worked extremely hard throughout the course of the season. Coach Vasquez and Coach Vicini are pr so proud of their efforts. Their season will conclude this week and they look forward to honoring our eighth graders on Tuesday and Thursday night. The wrestling team. <coughs> the wrestling team finished with a record of eight to three for the season. They had four student athletes win the GMC big school tournament. Jabril Caravan, Robert Fritz, Matthew Brown, and Lucas Tang. Lucas and Jabril also won their match against a small GMC school to become Middlesex County champions. Coach Poor, Coach Arvonitis, and Coach Basaya want to thank the boys who put in an amazing effort all year and want to wish the eighth grade class the best of luck in their high school careers. The boys basketball team is also doing very well this season and is almost about ready to wrap it up. Thank you for your time and support. Great job. Excellent Thank you job. so much. The wrestling team looks like it has a bright future, huh? Absolutely. I believe and so. Mr. Callahan? Yep. Looks good for you. Any questions for Ms. Kuntz? So, Morg, the, you mentioned um, a couple of community service <coughs> activities taking place, one involving pets, correct? Mm-hmm. Is that tied into the donation of pet food? Or is it the yep. same thing? Mm -hmm. Outstanding. Are you participating in that? Uh, yeah, for the donations for the points for each grade. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, good for you. <laughs> that's, that's outstanding. Excellent. Good job. Make us proud, as always. Great job, as always, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Very Thank impressed you. and proud. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a good night. You too. You too. Good night. Stay safe. <coughs> okay. We'll see um, you guys in two weeks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Isn't that fun? <laughs> two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> they cannot wait. <laughs> okay, I'll be brief. I just want to... Um, uh, touch on one thing, okay? Something that a few of us uh, were were able to attend this week, or was it uh, last week, right? Uh, the ribbon cutting for Bombers and Beyond Cafe. Um, amazing job, amazing job. I mean, I, I don't know what to say. I, there's no words. Mr. Naster and Dr. Defina, yeah. I, it was great. great. It was great to be there. It was great to be part of it, to see those kids. You, I love going there. I know Mr. Fernandez goes there and gets coffee also in the morning. and. Uh, it's, it's just they're so happy, you know, and uh, and the town is happy. Uh, we're, we're everyone's embracing this. So uh, I, I've said it a million times, and I'll say it a million times until uh, until the end. Thank you, great job, and, and all of you. Thank you so much. Thank great you. job, made us very proud. I was there this morning <coughs> at about 10:30, and it was packed. Really? Um, it it didn't start to dwindle until close to 11:30, um, which they close at 12. But it was packed at uh, about 10.30. I mean, standing room only. Awesome. It was it was fantastic. Great. Now, residents... And we're getting regulars now. There are, like, people that regularly oh, come in, great. which is awesome. Awesome. Great. And as I said earlier, now we're accepting credit cards, <coughs> so that should also help us as well. So um, just uh, like you, Mr. Esposito, I I'm incredibly proud um, and very impressed by uh, what Mr. Naster and Dr. Defina, as well as our extraordinary teachers, have been able to... Um, produce yeah. Agreed. yeah I just want to echo those sentiments it's an incredible job that, 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 that you've done I know this this program is only in very few spots and make sure it's very cutting edge but I think what even delineates us even more so than the few other spots put this is <coughs> that doesn't get the attention is the apartments that you have uh, upstairs that gives real world hands-on experience to, to to our students to be able to, to live to live on their own 
the combination of the two, I don't believe is done any, anywhere else in this country. That's an amazing idea that all of you had and amazing execution of it. Um, I really want to thank you on behalf of our community and behalf of the board. Thank you, really. It's a tremendous job. Okay. Mrs. Bloom, do you have some highlights uh, for us uh, today? No, I have no highlights. However, okay. highlights are only the uh, second meeting. The, okay. the young ladies cover it all anyway. So yeah, they do a good job. My words will be few. However, at this time, I would like to recognize two of our staff members who were recently honored by the Sayreville American Legion. Lisa Green was given the American Legion Certificate of Appreciation along with a bouquet of flowers <clears throat> for organizing the Veterans Day and the Flag Day ceremonies at Truman School, which were conducted by the American Legion. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I never thought I had a small mouth. Uh, a photograph of her receiving the award was in the latest issue of the South Amboy Times, as well as Christian Beavers, who had her third grade class at Wilson School create holiday cards for the veterans at the Menlo Park Veterans Home, which were hand delivered to the facility. And I believe that was done by the ADK sorority, which is a, a sorority of retired, uh, um, not only retired, but of teachers, a teacher sorority. The American Legion is grateful that our children are being taught to honor and remember the veterans. And I would like to conclude by saying that my husband, my son, to get emotional now. My brother, my brother-in-law, as well as my late sister-in-law and uncle are all veterans. My husband is the current post commander, and I am a member of the Legion Auxiliary. Thank you very much. Awesome. That's terrific. Thank, Thank you, you everyone for, our, for their Legion. service, really. Okay. Thanks, Ms. Bloom. Mrs. Bloom. Uh, it's now that time. Our presentations, Here Dr. Labby. Yes, and we are back with the budget presentations. Before we introduce our first speaker, I just want to review with you the, what's left of the budget development calendar. Obviously, this evening, Mr. Nasser is going to present on special services. Dr. Shediak is going to present on curriculum and instruction. And Mr. Glock Malloy is going to present on technology, as well as security. Correct, Mr. Glock Malloy? Next, uh, at our next meeting on February 21st, Dr. Aguilis will present on personnel. Mr. Siniglia will present on transportation. And Mr. Colemansberger and Ms. Hill will present on buildings and grounds as well as capital projects within the budget. Those will conclude our presentations. Depending on when the governor releases the state aid figures, that will determine whether we ask you to approve the preliminary budget <coughs> on either March 7th or March 21st. That's our tentative schedule, and of course, I believe the adoption of the budget and the budget hearing are on, I'm just gonna say May 5th or May 6th. Yeah, I, I can't recall offhand what it is, but that is our budget development calendar. With that said, why don't we begin this evening with Mr. Naster on special services. All right, my apologies. So once again, on behalf of Dr. Dufina and Mrs. DeChico, we would like to thank this board for allowing us a few minutes tonight to share with you some highlights from our department from this current school year, as well as our goals and the corresponding budget implications for those goals. So. <clears throat> So as always, we began the school year this past summer with our Camp Excel extended school year. Um, it's noteworthy this past year because in conjunction with Dr. Shadiak's uh, learning acceleration program, we did service just under 600 students. In years past, particularly pre-COVID, we were servicing about 285 students. So we do thank our families for really showing us the support this past summer um, and sending their children to us. We are currently in our, our second year of a two-year professional development initiative, um, which provides on-site um, full day coaching for our 
special education teachers K through five. Um, we partner with For the Love of Literacy. And this is noteworthy because Dr. Ken Coons, the founder of For the Love of Literacy, is currently the president of the International Literacy Association. He's traveling the world, multiple continents this past school year, meeting with world leaders in, in the science of reading, and actually bringing <coughs> back the, those um, evidence-based um, techniques directly to our teachers in the classroom. So we're really fortunate for this partnership. Um, we do fund this through one of the pandemic relief funding, the American Rescue Plan, um, and ESSER funding grants. <coughs> Similarly, we're using our ARP, or American Rescue Plan IDA funding, to provide supplemental instruction. That's one-to-one -one instruction for those students identified the IP team, identified by the IP team as, be as benefiting from this type of um, instruction, um, preschool through 12th grade. Um, ARP IDA is additional grant funding that we received this past year. Okay, um, we did use um, American Rescue Plan funding to expand our mental health supports. It was actually a requirement of the um, grant that we received. Um, so prior to um, this year, we were offering um, tier three mental health or therapeutic supports at the middle school and high school through our partnership with Effective School Solutions. Using the grant funding, we expanded this to provide tier two services at all of our el elementary schools, um, as well as uh, psychiatry for those students who need it at no cost to our families. And um, very important to us um, is the crisis or risk assessments that ESS does for us in every building um, for unfortunately the um, large number of, of homicidal and suicidal um, ideations that we, we receive um, on a regular basis. Um, you'll see in our tuition line accounts funding for um, 13 tuitions for, for out of district programming. You'll see when you look through the budget, a designation called S343, which stands for the Senate bill that led to Public Law 2021, Chapter 109. Um, this allows for certain students in 18 to 21 year programs to remain in school for an additional year. So prior to this piece of legislation, students under um, federal reg le legislation, IDEA, um, were allowed to, to remain in school through the year in which they turned 21. This allows students to remain in school for that one extra year through the year in which they turn 22. It's a three-year initiative. Next year is the last year of this initiative, but it is fully funded by the Department of Education, so we will receive back 100% of those tuition costs from the State Department of Ed, as well as 100% of the transportation costs. Um, but I do have to pay the bills along the way as they come in on a monthly basis, so that's why you'll see them noted in, in, in the budget. Um, you also see new for, for, for um, next year, a small amount set aside for general supplies from 132 Main Street. Um, it's pretty obvious, you know, we, we may have some, some costs over there that we could not predict. So um, we will ask this board to support a few thousand dollars in general supply funding for that program. You'll also see a small amount set aside for our cooperative ed students so that we can pay the, the salaries that, that um, those students who are working there will, will receive. And YMCA membership as well. That satisfies the physical education requirement for those students. 
have a question at this point. I just so the board maybe a quick explanation. The uh, an outside company helps us <coughs> run this uh, Armors Cafe, correct? Yep. So we make money. There's a profit, right? Where does the profit? No, come? an outside company doesn't help us. Well, I thought it was uh, the Compassion Cafe. Yes, we you. initially started talks with them, but okay, so um, they never came to the table. So this is help. totally in house. Help. Our food service department. Oh, okay. partnering with our special services department. Gotcha. I thought it was in conjunction with. Thank you for that. So mm -hmm. I, I learned something. Um, just real quick, profits. What are we doing with them? So I don't know that we've shown profit yet. Well, we won't yet. Um, no. I, I think that the, the food costs, the, the, the prices that this board approved are just huh? a little bit more than what we it, would pay. It, um, it, it all really goes to the food services enterprise account. So that just goes in as revenue. revenue. So the same thing with regard to any revenues that we make over our expenditures for food services, we have to we have to spend on equipment and things like that. Yeah, we're considering it more of like a catering kind of fund because um, we are we do have other costs that we're not offsetting it by. Like in the budget for next year, we do have budgeted to pay for the students, so we're not going to take in enough money to pay those students to work in okay. the cafe at this point. Maybe at some point, but right. so far we right. don't. Of course. No, so right time. now that's being paid locally, and then just the actual cost of goods and things like that are coming out of food services. Okay, so we don't want to make it its own P and L then, as a separate entity. We want. I mean, to I do track. I will track it separately. I I'll wish have you would, because I'm curious. I mean, I, I will. It's in there separately. It's just that it's still all part of the enterprise fund. Understood. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and, and you will see the cooperative education student uh, salaries <laughs> itemized in the budget as well. Very important to us this year um, is our request for a new supervisor. We would ask this board for a, uh, the strongest of considerations for a supervisor at 132 Main Street. The obvious reasons, you know, we have the public coming in and out. They have access to the, the program. Um, we would like the supervisor to be the custodian of funds over there because we do have cash um, exchanging hands as well as beginning today credit cards. Um, so um, it's pretty obvious that we need some on-site supervision. Dr. Dufin and I are doing our best to, to manage that but um, I don't know that we can sustain it full time um, going forward. But beyond the, the obvious reasons, um, this is a curriculum-based program. The State Department of Ed does have very specific work-based learning requirements for this program. So the supervisor will provide um, that supervision. There's training plans that need to be done. There's um, on-site inspections. There's OSHA requirements. I mean, we think a supervisor would really, really be able to um, help us with that. But beyond that, um, last week was, was really exciting, and I know we had a lot of enthusiasm but I feel like we're just getting started and we can do so much more with this location and this program. And I would ask a supervisor to start uh, going out and start prospecting, developing more relationships, and maybe partnering with somebody who can come in and, and do some things with us, um, as well as locating other um, community uh, small businesses where those students who are with us who do not necessarily like food services could have a chance to go out and work. We have choice and, and I think our adult students should have choice as well. So again, um, we do ask you for um, the strongest of considerations um, when we look to bring some, some, some of these positions back from the, the budget cuts. Also important to us is a school social worker um, at the preschool level. Um, <clears throat> we know that the preschool has, has, um, has grown from about 150 preschool students not too many years ago to just under 800. Obviously, the locations have multiplied. The number of staff members have grown, except for our child study team services. They have remained flat. And Slover School is the only building right now in the district without a child study team member assigned to the building. Um, so um, in consultation or collaboration with Audrey Burns, who was also told to increase her social services by the Department of Ed as part of the um, accepting the, the preschool expansion aid, um, we'd like to, to, to um, share that uh, social worker with her. 50% funded locally and 50% funded by the grant so that we can, we can put a child study team member at Slover and um, stop having to pull the, the, the child study team member from Cheesequake to go over and try and cover that building. And finally, um, for the first time um, in about 10 years, um, we do see an increased uh, need at, at the high school for staffing, um, the, um, particularly in the social studies department. We're currently servicing 172 students um, in a special education social studies uh, class. Mostly in-class resource, some pull-out replacement, 
but we do see an increase of 38 students next year, <coughs> and that should remain flat, or should remain at that level for the next three years. So we do need to add five teaching sections next year. Without this position, we'll have to either pull from science, math, and social studies, um, which would result obviously in increased class sizes, or we'd have to ask teachers who are teaching five with a duty to teach six uh, periods. So it's, it's important to us. It might not be as flashy as the other positions, but it, it is a need that we've identified. And it's teacher, one? One teacher, yeah. Just one, okay. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> and finally, this board has asked us to consider uh, providing a banquet for our unified athletes, just like every other sport. So you'll see a, a small amount set aside in a new line account, special services mis miscellaneous account, so that we can do that um, using our cafeteria at the end of, of next year. If I could just take you through our goals very quickly. The first goal um, was a multi-year goal that this board has, has lived and breathed with us, um, and that's the, the um, opening of 132 Main Street. It took me 25 minutes, I'm told, to thank all of those people who contributed to this program. I appreciate your, um, your, your gratitude toward, toward myself and Dr. Jafina, but there were so many people, as you heard, that really put their heart and soul into this program. Um, so I, I obviously can't take the time to, to do that again tonight. But I would like to note that um, Jimmy Comisberger and Kenny Sodowski from our facilities department um, really, really um, got this program up and running. They went out of their way to really uh, make this happen for us. Um, Nick Cittadino, our facilities director, really came through on, on the kitchen and food services end and, and really is, is producing some nice product for us. And um, probably most importantly, um, Andrew Vanderbeck and Kaylee Fazzini are two teachers who, as you can see when you go over there, are beloved by the community. And then our, our second goal, again, not as flashy as the first goal, but just as important to us, is our focus on curriculum instruction. Um, research is clear that students who, students with disabilities who are educated in the general education program to the maximum extent possible have much greater post high school outcomes than our students in the more restrictive setting. So through a variety of, of oversight, professional development, and programming that, that the district provides, we're really emphasizing the least restrictive placement and least restrictive decision making um, as much as possible, just so that we can keep an eye on the end game, which is to prepare our kids for post high school life. You're thinking there though, right? I know you're thinking already. <laughs> what do we do after 21? I know you are, right? Well, this is uh, we've talked, Denmark, and, right? and if you go back to 132 Main Street, the, one of the, the, the reasons why we, we brought this um, concept to Dr. Labby was that our special ed parent group um, was telling us that um, we utilize a lot of uh, programs in uh, other um, townships, and they're pretty good programs, mm -hmm. um, but the kids are coming home at 21, and they're home again. They're not working. The parents don't know what to do. And we thought that why not provide paid learning and then hopefully expand the program so that the kids can come back, maybe through our food services program, and work there as adults. So be great. Th that's one of the goals. Be great. Can, you know, after 21, then what, right? Yeah. You don't want to forget about them. Yeah. So, excellent. Yeah. Glad you're thinking that, that way. There is somebody who told me that we'll probably uh, lease the whole building at some point, but somebody? I won't say who. Okay. The main center. <laughs> excellent. So with that, this does conclude our presentation. If you have any questions or comments, I'd be happy to take them. But if you have any difficult questions, please send them <laughs> right over to Dr. Dufina. <laughs> Anyone? Yeah, I just have one, uh, one question. Did Jimmy hang the chandelier yet? No, no. That's the game. You want me to pull the praise back from Jimmy? I'm sorry? I'll pull Jimmy's praise back. <laughs> no, it's okay. <laughs> Yay for Jimmy. <laughs> I just have one question. I don't expect an answer because obviously this is more of a question to generate to see if you want to look into it. Uh, I know that now that we have our students as, as employees, uh, the state through various departments and divisions fund a lot of jobs for individuals in the communities sometimes. Perhaps we, we, we may want to consider looking into some of these programs since they are now an employee and not just a student. Some of those programs may, may be able to fund some of those positions. Yeah. Um, again, I don't expect to have an answer to that because clearly I just threw this in your lap and like a time bomb here, right? Mm -hmm. um, but j just something to think about that maybe we can explore looking into that. All right. If you have a lead, please send it to me. I will. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? 
Any questions for Mr. Nasker? Okay. Thank you very much. Excellent job. Thank Excellent. You. Okay, Mr. Glock Malloy, that's a hard presentation to follow, but you're up. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Uh, so for starters, joining us here tonight, we have our Director of Technology, Michael Ranowitz, and our Supervisor of Technology, Christopher Makeley. Oh, and Mr. Spag for security, yes. But he's always here, so <laughs> just part of the background. He's Sorry. never not here. He's <laughs> never not here. So taking a look at our technology and security budget presentation, um, we're going to start off by looking at some of our 22-23 uh, goals that we've completed so far this year. And we're also going to look at what we are targeting for 23-24. Um, so our first couple of bullet points there are, are ones that we've seen um, annually for the last f few years, and they're actually some of the hardest ones for us to maintain. And that basically is sustaining our life cycle plan for our devices, our hardware, our software, our student one-to-one -one devices, our instructional staff devices, which takes up a huge part of our technology budget year in and year out. Um, but maintaining that is what allows us to continue to offer the services that we have without having to pull anything back year over year. So those are some big ones that we've been able to maintain and, and keep in this 22-23 budget, and we do currently have them budgeted and sustained in 23-24 as well. Um, one project that is ongoing, you know, it's achieved and in progress. Um, we have been working on a multi-year cybersecurity response plan. Uh, inclusive of which is increasing our physical as well as our digital network security. Um, this will always be an ongoing and in progress. This is not something we will ever have fully achieved because this is a constant moving target. Um, so while we have achieved what we were looking to target for this school year, um, this is one that we will continue to move forward into future years as well. Um, one of our goals for this year was to budget for and upgrade our virtual network um, server infrastructure. Now, we did achieve that in a way. We revised that. We are having an alternate plan, which I'll talk about for our 23-24 budget in a few minutes. Um, but we are moving to a slightly re revised version of that plan. Um, and then lastly, on our goals for this year was to budget for uh, an additional technology integration facilitator, specifically for 612. Unfortunately, budgetarily, we were not able to support that one this year. So it is something that we're going to continue to, to move forward for and to, to look for in the future. Um, but as of right now, that is the one area from our 22-23 goals that we do not have uh, in play. Over in security. Um, we've been and, and continue some more to our technology, maintaining our access control, communications, and our camera infrastructure. Um, that is all in place for 22-23. Um, staff all buildings with our second shift campus monitors. Now, we have been back and forth on this one. We have had some people join us. We've had some people leave. We've had to move some people from second uh, to first shift. So currently, we are just shy of our goal in this process, but Mr. Sprague and Dr. Aguilis have been completing some interviews. So we are hoping to have that fully in place um, within the coming weeks, actually. Continue expansion of our upgraded uh, district in interagency communication plan. So we did achieve everything we were looking to do for this year. Um, we are waiting for some parts to come in before we can roll these out to the building. It has been a slow go on actually getting the information or getting the equipment into the district. Um, but we were able to fund and order everything that we needed for this upgrade um, for the 22-23 year, and we'll continue to do that going forward. Uh, drill and refine our reunification and emergency management plan. Similar to our cybersecurity plans, this is an ongoing process. Our drills are monthly. They're regular in all of our buildings. Sometimes they are planned. Sometimes we have unplanned. Um, and we are constantly revising that plan as new guidelines come out from the state, as new best practices come forward. So similar to cybersecurity, 
our drilling and reunification process, um, while achieved for what we were looking to accomplish in 22-23 so far, it is an ongoing process uh, to continue to maintain that and keep that up to date. And last up in our security section, um, train targeted staff for a 23-24 implementation of the DOE threat assessment and management program. Um, Earlier this year, the governor signed into law that all schools will have a threat assessment and management program in place for the 23-24 school year. The DOE also rolled out um, early training for this. Um, in the first half of the year, we targeted our administrative team members who will be part of these teams. And in the second half of the year, we will be targeting our non-administrative members as the um, statute requires that we have certain key staff members involved, such as nurses, guidance counselors, mental <coughs> health professionals, as well as other individuals that we may select based on the specific building. So we are on progress. So we've achieved what we were targeting for the fall, and we are on progress to complete that going forward through the rest of 22-23. Eric, is the state uh, giving a grant out for that, or are they just saying do it? Right now, it's just do it. Just do it. Okay. <clears throat> so, looking forward at 2324 and our technology, obviously, the first two bullet points, as I mentioned, these are ones that we'll see carry forward year after year. This is just sustaining what we have in place as far as our devices, software. Um, we are also, again, looking to update and maintain our cybersecurity structure. One of the areas that we, we definitely have to continue to work forward, and we were able to do this in several buildings this year, but physical network security um, is one of the hardest things for us to do in a school district because when these buildings were built, uh, computer networks didn't really exist in the fashion they did. So a lot of our network closets are shared resources. They may also be supply closets. They may be you know, used for other purposes. Um, so this will be a continuing and ongoing goal for us to harden our physical security um, so that that equipment isn't uh, exposed to risk, uh, be it natural risk, um, such as power outages or, you know, exposure to floods, um, bursted pipes, uh, as well as risk from individuals that may, you know, either intentionally or accidentally look to do damage to that equipment. We have been and, and are trying to continue to move forward on um, replacing our interactive smart boards. Many of our boards now are um, 15 to 20 years old. We have been replacing a good number of these each year, um, but it is a continued and ongoing process. Um, we are looking to upgrade our district network and switching infrastructure. This year, um, we are just about finished with our wireless upgrade, where all the access points inside the building um, are, are deployed and upgraded, and we are in the process of installing the exterior ones. Next year, we are looking to target doing the switching infrastructure um, for an upgrade. And then again, um, as a line item there, as part of our strategic plan, we are looking to, to fund the additional technology um, integration coach teacher position. Coming over to security, again, much like technology, some of those first bullet points are continued year over year, maintaining what we have, uh, making sure that our plans are updated, um, continuing with our multi-year district interoperation uh, radio network plan, um, continuing to refine our drone reunification process, maintaining our two-shift campus monitor coverage, um, develop security procedures for our new transportation complex as that starts to come online, and then obviously we'll be implementing the NJDOE's threat management program. So coming down to our last two slides, just diving into these a little bit, I know it's a little hard to see up on the board there, but for um, board members, if you have it in front of you, um, the first several items on the technology budget proposal, we were able to fund in the proposed budget that's moving uh, forward. The items in red with dollar figures uh, behind them were some key items that were cut initially as we moved through the budgetary process. So obviously you can see that we are currently funding uh, in the 23-24 budget, maintaining what we have in place as far as software and hardware. Um, we are maintaining the resources that we need to enhance and maintain our cybersecurity plans and programs, and we were able to fund the network switching infrastructure project thanks to some creative financing work by Aaron. Uh, what we were not able to maintain in the budget, um, any funding to 
improve our physical network security. Again, that's our network closets, things of that nature. And this is, uh, as I alluded to in the last slide, a pretty important area because much of those network closets will control key components um, of both our instructional as well as our security infrastructure within the district. Um, interactive board replacements, currently we do not have any funding in next year's budget to replace any of our interactive boards or upgrade any of the additional ones in the district. We are not currently funding the technology facilitator in next year's budget. Um, we had looked to upgrade the sound system as well as a video wall here now that we've moved into this room for Board of Education and other meetings. Um, that item we have cut from the budget currently. Um, there were several small software enhancements that we were not able to fund, um, as well as some academic pieces. And currently the board had asked us to look into virtual reality and augmented reality, and we are running several demos in the district right now. Um, based on those demos and pilots that we're running, we estimated about a $200,000 first year implementation for that program. And while we did attempt to budget that, that's currently not in our funding for next year. Um, if we are able to receive additional funding in the course of this budget, um, obviously the board had asked us to look at the VR, AR um, software and hardware, so that would be on a priority list to look at um, restoring. Mm -hmm. And really one of the other major areas that I would say is the interactive boards and the physical network security, because those are critical to our instructional process as well as our operation process. Uh, before I jump to security, any questions on the technology? You keep guys. throwing facilitator in on each page. What are you trying to get a sub subliminal message? That out was there? part of our long-term strategic plan to have yeah, a I technology remember. facilitator at, at the different grade level spans. Yeah. Um, so as that was part of our strategic plan that the, uh, the board approved a number of years ago now, um, I have been including that uh, as part of our goals to move forward through. Who's doing this now? Just amongst all of you, like by committee? As far as the, the, the work that this facilitator the facilitator, right, we have um, Barbara DeSantis mm -hmm. who handles um, much of the grade span for elementary, middle, and high school, and then um, Kathleen, Kathleen McDade at the preschool level. Gotcha. Those are our two positions. Okay. So the goal was to roll out a third that would target six to twelve, and then you know have one of our existing staff members focus just on elementary. Yeah. So we're two thirds of the way there from what we needed in the strategic plan. We've right. just not made that. You know, that last third. Gotcha. Thank you. <coughs> so then lastly, looking at security, similar structure to the technology <coughs> plan, the items um, in purple up top were some key items that we were able to maintain funding for in the 23-24 budget, and the items down below in red were items that we were not able to maintain currently in the 23-24 budget. So obviously maintaining what we have, critical to what we're doing, we were able to roll out our um, network radio plan for next year as well, which will bring on several additional buildings and should, um, we believe, will complete that project for the district and all buildings will be fully rolled over onto the new radio system. Um, a security plan for the transportation complex is, for the most part, a zero cost item. So, you know, other than some general supplies and things that we'll need for that, that was uh, not a large budgetary uh, piece that's mostly planning on the part of um, our transportation department, Aaron, Jeff, and myself. Implementation of the DOE threat assessment program, and Anthony, you'd asked about grants. Uh, most of what is in this is training and procedures. There's not a lot in the way of a cost for implementing the threat program. Um, the training's all being offered by the state at no cost. Right. And then procedures internally is, it's an administrative process. Okay. Um, you know, depending on what the state may require, we may add into something like what we do for our HIV management or discipline management. There may be a, a tool that we'll need to use, but as of right now, that's not a requirement. Gotcha. Okay. Um, additional security cameras for our new buses. Uh, that is included currently in the actual purchase of the buses, so we'll include the security cameras there. But as far as items that we were not able to fund that were big ticket items, um, any additional security cameras, many of our principals had looked for additional places to put cameras in their buildings, currently don't have funding supported for that. Um, we had discussed rolling out ID cards similar to what the high school and the middle school have for our pre-K through five program. You can see there that to do that for all of our remaining buildings would be about $65,000, but if we 
chose to target specific buildings, we're looking at about a $9,500 turn up cost for any building that we onboard with the ID system. Um, and then lastly, replacement metal detectors. Um, much like a lot of our technology equipment, uh, we are getting to the point where some of our first generation metal detectors are reaching a, a point in their life where they should start to be replaced. Um, so while that will become a high priority item, it's not an emergent item. All of our equipment is in place and working and functional for next year. Um, but we are getting to the point where we have to start moving those devices onto a life cycle plan as well. So are, these we the, are these the movable ones? The walkthrough. Or the, the walkthrough ones? Yes. So the ones we put on the football field or the ones that say stationary at the high school? Correct. Which one? They're all the same. Oh, because I thought the movable ones were like three or 4,000. That's why I was wondering how you got to 10. Like, well, uh, we were looking at two. Alone. We were looking at two metal gotcha. detectors, um, Five. which, and, and they range in price depending on the specific feature sets. Uh, but you're right, right around 4,000 right now. For are, they, are they better, are they more state of the art or are they the same as we have now? So we have several at the high school and the middle school that were our second generation, mm -hmm. um, which have a, a better ability to identify quickly where the detection point is, right. where the first generation ones, they walk through, they alert, and then the the security guard, the campus monitor, has to then use a hand wand to identify the specific target point. Gotcha. The newer generation ones basically show zones so that as you walk through, it says, you know, the the item is top, middle, or, or bottom, which you know, speeds up our process. Sure, sure. So the, the current generation ones will at least do three zone. They do have some prohibitively expensive ones that can do up to 20 zones. That's probably not necessary for what we're doing. Um, that would be more uh, airport grade security, things of that nature. Uh, we'd probably look to do the current generation three zone if we were purchasing any new ones. You never know, I think there's going to be grants coming out for this soon. There is. We're constantly looking for Federal that. governments. Security is one of the areas where we, we can often find grants. Um, we were able to do a, a good chunk of the radio project on grants, so it's definitely something we keep an eye out. Right. I have one other question, too. Just Absolutely. Other than the fight or the incident the other week, um, where there was a line to get in the school again, people were posting it, but it, it was in the very beginning. I remember it was time consuming for the kids to get in. It's gotten better, right? Do we have any complaints? Is, are we rolling through now? Like the kids waiting outside for a long time? Not generally. It's, it's moving, it's doing more. Good. Our process, I mean, Jeff, along with the principals, is always refining the process. Mm -hmm. um, we've gotten to the point where it's pretty streamlined, moving through, and people aren't uh, late to classes, late to the building. Whenever we do have bottlenecks, uh, you know, we evaluate why, and we look at that, and we, we find our process where needed. That's so great. It's That's not there. There is never a backup, but as a general rule, we're, we're not backed up day to day. Good. Thank you. Great. Excellent work. I have a question, Eric. Absolutely. Um, for the 23-24 budget, um, the first item that's in red, the physical network security upgrades and enhancements for 105K. Mm -hmm. What's the cost of not doing that? I mean, that sounds like something that if we don't do it this year, we would have to do it eventually. And I, I guess my, we, when I see network security upgrade, right, if we're not upgrading, is there something that making us more at risk for so not doing this? What we're really looking at for those dollar figures is the, the upgrade to network closets. Um, and this takes a lot of ways, shapes, and forms. So the numbers based on what we were able to do this year, um, and in that case, it was Slover School. As we were building out that building, and there was, as we transitioned it back to classrooms, there was a significant, um, for example, the, the network closet for the back half of the building was literally in the middle of a room. Um, wasn't going to be very conducive for the preschool students to have to walk around a stack of network switches and not trip over the wires. Mm -hmm. um, so when we talk about upgrading that network physical security, a lot of times what we're looking at is moving our network closets to more secure locations, uh, possibly installing uh, higher security cabinets or monitoring systems. Um, and in some cases, it's, it's relocating something else so that the network closet is the secure item. Um, we had a number of situations in the high school which we were able to remediate uh, a year or so ago where rooms that were uh, maybe common rooms or something else at one point in time had become offices, um, had become classrooms, 
and where they were once uh, sufficient for you know, network security, they really weren't anymore. I can give you a good example with the middle school right now. The guidance conference room upstairs uh, is, in fact, the main network hub for the entire building. It's not an ideal situation to have a conference room and the core network equipment for an entire school to be the same room. Um, so when we're talking about physical upgrades, we're talking about basically what do we have to move or what do we have to install to uh, make those locations secure and off limits to non-authorized staff. Mm -hmm. So is the 105, that's for everything across the district? That's gonna cover about two to three network closets. This is something that we'd be doing year over a year bit for time. a number of years. So if we don't do it next year, it's just something that's gonna keep it's going to keep Remain rolling year to be to year. on the list. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Is there a cost to not doing it? The cost to not doing it is the the risk and exposure to that equipment. Yeah. Um, you know, it, the more exposed that equipment is to accidental damage or to intentional damage, you know, that is without going into details, you know, it can take out significant portions of our infrastructure. Yeah. And year to year, the cost won't jump. Exponentially, it'll, so it'll that cost, um, what I used to estimate that dollar amount was the cost of doing, uh, we did two at Slover and we did uh, one at the high school this current year. So I used the dollar amount for, you know, redesigning and moving three network closets. So about 100000 to do three closets. And the price alters based on, you know, what we actually have to do. You know, that's a services that's not a set fee. You know, if all we need to do is buy a secure cabinet um, and put sensors on it so that it's not exposed, that's <coughs> certainly cheaper than if we have to rerun all the cabling to an entire network closet to a different place in a building. Sure. And then finding space in the buildings also always a challenge. So. Yeah. I mean, I guess I would just, you know, just my two cents is, you know, maybe we would consider at least putting some funds to do some piece of that. It, it seems like it's not something that's gonna go away. Um, Agree, just, and, and just you know, at, at if and when we get state aid, that would be one of the the major items that I would ask the board to consider. Um, you may want to yeah. jot that one down as chair, finance chair. Just uh, it may be one we want to talk about putting back in. Yeah, I don't yeah, need to jot right. it down. Yeah, I, I, that'd be better than me. Okay. Uh, and that's also one, obviously. Make their recommendations yeah, I'm sure. When the money comes in. I'm sure. That's yeah. also one as where. As president, though, you might want to write it down. If the money comes in. If, <laughs> And, and that's one where obviously we don't have to say, you know, 100,000. If we say, okay, well, you know, there's whatever the number is to put towards it next year, honestly, that's one of those things where we can work with anything to start moving that process and keep moving that process forward. So, yeah. you know, we targeted a similar number to what we did this year, but, you know, we can scale that up or down as necessary. My other question is on the next page on the additional security cameras. Is t 10000 is the full cost? Based on what was requested by building administrators, reviewed by Jeff and myself, and identified as areas where we could use additional coverage, yes. Now, part of that includes break-fix. Um, so that's, you know, that number varies year to year um, based on where we redesign buildings, where we need additional coverage, as well as what breaks throughout the course of the year. Um, so 10,000 would cover everything that we identified as a need for next year, yes. Okay. Is that to say that in a future year that you know, there isn't $100 or you know, $10,000? That's hard to judge year to year. Um, we are well covered in all of our buildings, so a lot of what we look at when we say we need additional is where we've identified something that's happened throughout the course of the year and, um, you know, individual events have dictated, you know, really when we look at where we have two cameras, we had an incident, you know, in the middle of those two and you really couldn't see what you needed to see. So that's an area where we need, or it's around a blind corner or <coughs> somewhere where we had well outfitted it, the building already, but based on something that happened, we identified, you know what, you really just couldn't see what you needed to see at that point. Um, yeah. But I think that was about five or six years ago that we did the full camera installs, roughly. I think three to four. Yeah. Okay. So at that point, we we really mapped each building and we put coverage everywhere. So there there is virtually nowhere in our building that isn't covered. Mm -hmm. It's just where we've seen particular areas where something's happened, or sometimes it's construction 
you know, you install, you know, HVAC units or something of that, and now where you once had a camera, you don't have a view anymore, or you only have half a view, and you have to look at a scenario like that. Yeah. Uh, again, just my two cents. I feel like that's a small enough number. We can probably find that somewhere. It seems like a high importance item. And I would say we, we always make that work somehow. Yeah. You know, we, we never leave our buildings unsecured from a camera perspective. If something breaks, you know, we'll find a way to fix it. Thank you. I have one question, Eric, about the security plan for the new transportation complex. Are we going to have cameras there? We are. Since it's off site. Okay. Great. Cameras, access control, much like any of our school buildings. Perfect. I just have one, one question on the bus on the cameras on the buses. Do they only cover the interior or do they cover the exterior as well? Our current ones cover both to some degree. Um, there are additional cameras that you can always add to, I mean, you could have a thousand cameras on a bus if you wanted to. Right, I mean, I, I guess the point I'm, I'm, I'm getting at, one of the issues, not only have a lot of individuals told me, I've personally seen a lot, we have a lot of drivers that drive, drive by our buses when, when they're picking up kids at their, their stop sign, um, which is very unsafe. And I know we, we spoke about this last year at some point when our, our transportation leader was here. So I guess I'm following up on that to see do our cameras have do our cameras have the capability to capture the drivers as as they're passing by, and if so, do we want to explore uh, taking further action on on that? You know, it's ironic. I just had a conversation this morning with Mr. Siniglia about that, and he will be talking more about cameras when he presents to you folks on the 21st. Okay, so I'll I'll table that. But I, I I can't add that we are actually piloting on seven buses the actual cameras that are used to detect uh, the license plates and, okay, and makes and models of vehicles that go ahead and um, run through the red light of, of, the, of the bus when they're pulled over. That's fantastic. But on top of that, all of our buses have cameras, and I think Mr. Glockmore yeah. was gonna say that, in which you can see through um, the vantage point uh, of the driver through the front windshield. Mm -hmm. And we had an actual case this week in which someone egregiously blew through uh, the red light of our bus, actually passed two cars to go through it, and we got a perfect shot of it. Okay. The only problem was the car did not have a license plate. No. <laughs> um, so our current cameras that we have on all of our buses have the capability of capturing the license plate in the rear of any vehicle that passes us. This pilot system, uh, this pilot system uh, of cameras that you know we're using in those seven buses, that's the actual cameras that are designed for this very purpose. The other ones I referenced they, are not designed for that purpose. They capture but, it, but we get incidental lucky. benefit of right. it. So, Mr. Siniglia, when he presents to you folks in two weeks, he'll share with you the actual cost of the actual cameras so that we get a better idea of, is that something we want to invest in, or can we get the same job done with the current cameras that we have right. that do have that vantage point through the windshield? One of the other areas with the school buses that we identified this year, um, and something we're targeting with our cameras as we buy additional buses and even retrofit some of the ones we have, um, with the expansion and advent of the preschool, the standard deployment of cameras in the buses because of the size of the students, we actually need more cameras in those buses because you simply can't see them <laughs> over the seats. Um, yes, so that, that was is another the problem. Piece. It is, and where you know you typically have a deployment. It sounds of funny, but it's, it's, bus, it's, it's scary. So that's another area that we're looking at as you know we expand the buses. They're too tiny. Yeah. I have a question. I know it's it's been talked about in New Jersey legislature since I think about 2017, but currently I don't think buses can legally capture or do anything with the video if we put the cameras in front to catch license plates. It's like the red light camera scenario. Yeah, it's, it's, you can't we can it report to it to the police, say, hey, right. give them the information. Issue well, ticket. apparently with this new system that we're piloting, it does provide the information that the police need in order to prosecute. So, I mean, I'm not sure what it is or what it isn't that, that they would need, but um, 
I would think anything that we can do to prohibit people from doing something as incredibly well, unsafe as that. I mean, I know that Mr. Sprague did send an email to um, the the head, Mr. The, I think it's Sorry. Lieutenant Braille, who is the um, Sergeant. or Sergeant Braille, who is you know the head of um, traffic in in Sarable, asking him to, to to monitor, have the patrols monitor Main Street where we seem to have most of the problems. So, um, but. Yeah, we did have that one particular case where, where in which we thought we haven't had enough information to share with them, but um, the car didn't have a license plate. I'm not sure what we could have done, even yeah. if it did, but I'm hoping there is something we can do because it, it would be a shame. You know, unfortunately, in our society, we don't tend to do anything until someone gets hurt, and it would be a shame to have to wait until that. No actually happens or happens again because I'm sure it's happened before where people have gone through those red lights and struck um, pedestrians, particularly children, so. Yeah, and I think the, I think there's a bit of a misnomer when we keep going back to the red light camera issue. Um, that was more of a political and decision made to remove that in Jersey as opposed to a court. I think more of the court challenge had, had more to do with uh, townships changing the timing of the light in order to capture more uh, more people running a, a red light as opposed to the actual camera. I mean, as we've seen, law enforcement uses door, uh, doorbell ring cameras and number of cameras I issuing. And the other issue with just using a camera was that you didn't have a complainant. Here, in, in our case, you're gonna have a complainant, which would be the, the uh, bus driver, and the camera would, would be supporting evidence. Um, just like, I mean, as unfortunately as we know in the current case, law enforcement's using door, doorbell ring cameras, and we've seen this, so cameras are used in law enforcement court cases all, all the time. Um, you obviously need a complaint, and you can't have the camera be the, the, sole, the sole complaint. But it's a question of, do we, do we want to tell our, our bus drivers to go ahead and report this and capture this? And we are doing forward? that. We'll, we'll yeah, let no, the, no, court, we we'll let the court system figure that stuff out. Right. We're gonna continue to provide our police department with as much information as we can for them to you know, go after people that are egregiously violating very necessary safety laws. Yeah, no, listen, and the cameras that you're talking about are excellent. Again, that's just another example of how we're really on the forefront of security. Um, I'll share a little story with you. Bore you for five minutes. Um, I got a phone call from some a former alumni who's moved out, out of state when we had the recent incident at the Shell Station. And they asked me, did that happen inside the school? And instantly, I told them, it's possible. The security we have, that could never happen. We have the security retention vestibules and all that. And these are things that most other schools don't have. Even districts where you would think crime rates and their other statistics they have would call for it much more so than us. So I think that's something, um, thanks to Dr. Lively, thanks to Mr. Malloy, and thanks to our president, who's really spearheaded that for the last few years. And uh, these cameras on the buses that you're talking about, again, are just another example of being truly, really in the forefront of this and being in front of many, many other school districts. Um, despite of what, what, what happens, our, our security, led by Mr. Sprague, and more importantly, all the boots on the ground, all the security officers that we have that don't get recognized, whose names I don't know, um, in conjunction with, with everyone here, has done a great job of keeping our, our school safe. And I think that's something that's, that's, that's really worth noting. And it kind of hit me when, when I got that phone call, because. Instantly, I hit. Of course not. You could, it couldn't have happened inside, but you couldn't say that at another school district. So, kudos to you guys and kudos on, on, on those cameras. And let's keep moving the ball forward. Great and job. Thank to, you. Just to that, the transportation department. We'll talk more about the cost um, of those cameras. But just to circle back to the school cameras, to give you an idea, a ten thousand individual cameras in the building, depending on whether they're the single or the four head or the two head. They're going to range between three hundred and a thousand dollars a camera, so it kind of gives you an idea of what we're looking at in that ten thousand range. Thank you. Any other questions? You had one, didn't you? No. Okay. Thank you. Good job. Thank you, Mr. Glock Malloy. Seeing that you took about an hour, uh, we only have about five minutes for Dr. Shediak to give two presentations. It's the questions, it's not the presentation. Um, Dr. Shediak is now going to present on her proposed curriculum and instruction budget. And right after that, or right after you have, you know, ask any kind of questions that you may want to ask, we are going to then go to her presentation on the 
2022 Start Strong assessment results. So let's begin with curriculum and instruction, Dr. Shadiak. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity to talk to you this evening and highlight some of the things that we have in the curriculum and instruction budget. I would also like to thank some members of my team who are here um, tonight to support us. Um, Dr. Dufina, she's part of um, Mr. Nastor's team, but she's also part of my team, <laughs> um, as is Ms. Is that DeSico. legal? <laughs> um, Mrs. Maharana, who is our math and business supervisor. Ms. O'Connor, who is our science and related arts and nursing supervisor. Mr. Howard, who's supervisor of social studies and professional development. And Mrs. Sokola, who's our director of guidance. Thanks for coming, guys. I appreciate it. Because they all have a vested interest in, in what, what we're asking for here. And they, they want to make sure that they don't get shorted on <laughs> anything here, right guys? Um, Dr. Dufina looks like she's freezing, so, know. you know. <laughs> it is a anything little you can do to speed this up. <laughs> I'm working on it. Well, we did go for cold as cold. That's not what we meant by cold as cold. Good one. Okay, so just um, I'll very quickly go through some of our accomplishments from the previous school year, last school year. So we wanted to improve students' math skills and we implemented some new courses, statistics, pre-algebra basic skills. We got new math textbooks last year. To increase student literacy skills, we um, expanded Fontes and Pinnell classroom to grades four and five. We piloted interactive writing in kindergarten and first grade. We got some new novels in classroom libraries in grades six through 12. We've been revising a lot of curriculum. You see it almost every board meeting. We're approving some new curriculum guides. Um, we got some new texts for our English language learners and we are continuing with our PSYOP training of the general <coughs> education <coughs> teachers. Yes. Using primarily grant funds, we were able to address some student learning gaps. We had our summer learning acceleration through Title I, our AP boot camp, um, through ESSER, credit recovery through Title I and ESSER, and expanded Tier 2 and Tier 3 interventions through both Title I and ESSER funds. Um, we are working to provide our students with 21st century learning opportunities. We expanded the Business Academy. We offered last year for the first time advanced placement computer science classes. We obtained the Middle School Career Exploration Grant, had a career exploration club, and we had a facilitator for that. Last school year, we were able to have the Air Force Junior ROTC program as an after school program at the middle school for eighth grade students. This year, unfortunately, due to staffing, we were unable to continue mm -hmm. that. But if we can get additional staffing, we, we are looking forward to going back to that. Professional development, we used Title II funds to pay for love of literacy last school year, the program that Mr. Nastor talked about. We have New, Te New Jersey teacher to teacher coming in to coach our teachers in grades K through five. And we offer a lot of programs through Sayreville University. So the current school year, our goals were to increase students' literacy and math skills. So we used the budget for this current school year to expand our Fontes and Pinnell shared reading program, to implement the Fontes and Pinnell writing program in kindergarten and first grade. We got additional phonics-based materials for ESL students. We were able to add to ASI academic support math teachers at the K-3 schools so that now each elementary school has their own math ASI teacher. And like I said, we continue to do curriculum revisions. You're probably tired of looking at all that curriculum that we, I keep sending to you. Again, address student learning gaps. This is a, a continued focus for us. And this has um, been funded through our grants, a combination of ESSER and Title I grants. As Mr. Nastery re mentioned earlier, our Summer Learning Acceleration Program really expanded this past year. 
the, our AP boot camp for the high school credit recovery that we were able to offer at no cost for the students in both the middle school and for some online high school courses. We expanded tier two and three, tier th three interventions and we are increasing the use of linkage benchmark assessments and data analysis with supervisors work in almost every department meeting, analyzing the data with their teachers and using that to help just address those learning gaps. We, um, Another goal for this school year was to provide students with 21st century learning opportunities. We started the Visual Arts Academy. We implemented two new middle school electives, Careerosity and Tech, tech, tech Tank, both associated with the Middle School Careers Grant. We um, revised K through five science. We're currently revising that social studies curriculum and the K through 12 health curriculum. We've been replacing texts at all levels and ordering additional texts due to shifting enrollments. So to go on to this, the upcoming school year, again, we have the three same basic goals, to increase students' literacy and math skills. One of the things that we included in the budget is a new English program for grades nine through 12. It's HMH into literature. It's a comprehensive program, much like we've done the Hontas and Pennell in grades K through five. It integrates writing and it provides a lot of scaffolding for our multi-language learners. And as I mentioned previously, that number is ever expanding. We are looking to expand the Hontas and Pennell writing program in grades two to five even though it's budgeted in the personnel budget, an additional ESL teacher due to the increased enrollment, an additional academic support instruction teacher at the middle school for math. We currently have two math ASI teachers at the middle school and we really need a third. <coughs> in order to address st student learning gaps, we're looking at doing the same thing we had the past two years. Again, all of this will be funded through the grant programs. So, but I do want you, I want that included in our budget so you're aware of, of what we are doing. And to provide students with 21st century learning opportunities, we're asking, we would like to have new textbooks for the high school and middle school social studies classes. Some of these textbooks are very, very old. We're talking copyrights of 2008, 2012, and the online, supplement and the online materials to those, which we really could use the digital versions, are no longer available for those older textbooks. So we would like to purchase new materials. We also have, at the eighth grade level, we have an entirely new course. It's, the, in the past it was always geography, but now we have a semester of civics. So we do need some materials to address that for, for the eighth grade social studies. We're looking at replacement text at all levels, and again, additional text due to <coughs> shifting enrollment. We do re rely less and less on the hard copy text. We have generally, what we purchase now is classroom sets, so that a teacher has a set of books that students can use in the classroom. But now all of the publishers are going with the online versions too, and with the students having the Chromebook, they, students don't have to bring the book back and forth, and they even use a lot of the digital access when they're in class, but we really feel it's important for them to have the hard copy, and it's interesting that they have actually, at this point, the cost for the hard copy texts are, have really come down, yet the digital licenses are going up. So, so, so they're, they're getting on to what the schools are doing with um, purchasing the materials. Um, and we have some new courses that have been approved recently. You know, we have the AP Pre-Calculus, the STEM Capstone, art courses. We're looking to possibly add American Sign Language at the high school. All of that will go along with additional costs, both for material, primarily for materials. <coughs> and we also included the integration of 
AR and VR technology across the curriculum. Now, fortunately, not all of these items made it into, <coughs> made it through the first round of budget cuts. But on the last slide, um, I, I highlighted some of the different items and the bigger ticket items, what the, what the cost is. For the HMH into literature, it's about $214,000 to do all four grade levels. Right now in the budget, we have cut half of that. So what we would do, if we cannot restore it for all four grade levels, we would implement it in grades nine and 11 because those are the two grade levels that will be tested. So we want to have the new materials for those students and then the following year implemented in grades 10 and 12. So we can kind of spread that out a little bit. Um, and that includes class sets and five years of digital licensing. For social studies and history textbooks, we're looking at for grades six through 11, approximately $317,000. At, at this point, all of that has been cut. So that's something that you know, we would like to at least partially restore if we can. $200,000, and I know Mr. Block Malloy mentioned this in his presentation, about $200,000 for the AR, VR technology, that is currently cut. $75,000 for the American Sign Language program materials. This does not include staffing. We're not sure what direction we would end up going in as far as the type of program we do. We're right now, it's in our course <coughs> description book, and students are able to sign up for it, but we have to see whether we will use an online platform <coughs> or if we would end up with a teacher in the classroom. But even if we don't, even if we <coughs> use an online platform, we still need a staff member to be present in the class with the students. So um, right now, that's about, we budgeted $75,000, which does not include any staffing. And when Mr. Um, when Dr. Agulis talks about personnel, he can include that. that that'll be part of his presentation. Um, again, the budget includes the things that we've done every year, classroom supplies for all courses, including in vision math workbooks, replacement texts at all levels, and additional texts as we need them for shifting enrollments, presenters for Sayreville University and Staff Development Day, out, um, that's, to a large extent, that's covered by our Title IIA grant, but not all of it. So we do have to budget some local money. The same out of district workshops and conferences are more often paid through, paid for through the district budget. Um, we also have, we also budget for course reimbursement for staff members, according to the contract. Staff members, certain staff members are entitled to reimbursement for graduate classes they take. Um, our ongoing sustained industry professional development, that again is largely covered by Title II, but not all of it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, as I said in the last bullet point, the grants are the primary source of professional development funds and it's supplemented by the local budget. So. That's what I have for curriculum and instruction. Any questions? Okay. Some questions. Sure. ASI teachers. When the principals were here, they all wanted teachers, right? That was the one thing they wanted. Were they speaking of teachers in the classrooms or additional courses to let, I mean, what, what were they, I should have asked them, but is this what they're looking for, a teacher in each classroom to help the teachers out? Well, an ASI teacher, you're not going, an ASI teacher doesn't go into every classroom. The ASI teacher works with students who are identified we have a whole criteria for identifying <coughs> students for tier one, tier two, and tier three interventions. The ASI teachers push into classes and sometimes they pull students out as a tier two intervention. They're not in that classroom, they're not in a classroom every day, and it's a combination of push in and pull out. We have in our K three schools, we have two language arts literacy ASI teachers in each school, and we now have one math ASI teacher. At the middle school, we have three, 
three language arts literacy ASI teachers, okay. and we have two math ASI gotcha. teachers. Gotcha. It's a long way from a few years mm -hmm. ago. Too. Yeah, I mean, we, we have come a long way. Yeah. Um, we, we, have, we, we have added ASI teachers, but they're a, it's something during the school day that, that we can offer to the students, and they work closely with the classroom teachers, they're our own teachers, it's, you know, and, and we do also offer the math and literacy academies both before and after school for students who are identified, that's a tier two intervention, and, but sometimes we have a difficult time with getting the students with transportation for before school or after school. So, um, yeah, the ASI teachers, I mean, they're, they're a good ongoing support to the students and to the teachers because usually they're, they're teachers who, who are somewhat experts in, in the field. Mm -hmm. Most of our ASI reading, language arts teachers are certified reading specialists, which is something that's really helpful. Gotcha. One, lastly, coaches. Do we have coaches? We have one instructional coach at the middle school. She's currently paid through the Title I grant. Mm -hmm. um, her salary's totally funded through that. She does also, to help out a little bit, because she previously was an ASI language arts teacher, she does take a couple groups of students to work with them. But she's an instructional coach. In there. fact, if you look at uh, tonight's agenda, you'll see the different grants that we use to offset right. her salary. Yes. It's, it's on uh, the That's finance right. portion of the agenda. Yeah. We have Thank one you. coach? We have one instructional coach at the middle school. We, we have to work on that, right? I mean, isn't that an integral part it, to make our teachers better and to have them to someone that they can talk to and say, I'm not getting this, I'm not getting through to this kid, what do I do? It, Where do it, they go now? A lot of times they will go to the ASI teachers um, the, you know, it, it's a tough decision. Are you going to fund teachers that will work directly with the students or, you know, with the coaches who are going to work with, with the teachers? But, you know, our, our supervisors also act as coaches, you know, and, and we do a lot of coaching through our observation cycle. You know, we, when we have our post-observation conference, we'll talk to to, to the teachers and we'll say, you know, I noticed this child, he was struggling with this. What are you doing? And, you know, and then we can help them. We also bring in New Jersey teacher to teacher to work with the teachers. They do demo lessons and then they meet with them. We have, um, for math, we use Dr. Milo, who is, um, works at Rowan University. And Dr. Coons. And Dr. Coons, who come, his team comes in. They're in the buildings all the time. It's a team, of, there's three of them, right? Correct, there's three, three coaches, 120 full days on site. Right. And then for behaviors, we have NJ Care that works with our teachers on, on that. So we might not have appointed people as staff members to be coaches, but we do contract with a variety of different providers that give that coaching and ongoing consultation to our teachers and staff members. Well, have we ever given consideration to go that route, though? I mean, yeah, it yeah works, I mean, right? like Truly. you, like you, the po the question you posed to every one of those principals: if money wasn't yeah, okay. an obstacle, yeah. you, you, would you well, do that? that? Yeah, I mean, put our money. I mean, that's but where we need to where put our money. It's not when you cut part. fifteen million dollars from already right. A, right. A, a a very trim budget, it, it's very difficult. Right. So you have to. I think we just need to to, to move our thinking. And again, I, you know, I'll, I'll bet on two ants running. I don't care. I love sports, but move our thinking more towards curriculum, okay? And maybe we have to, you know, steal a little from different places. I won't specifically <laughs> say anywhere, but I mean, what are we kidding me? We need coaches. We don't need uniforms. We need coaches. I mean, if anyone here we disagrees, please tell too. me. We we need we need a lot of we things. Need, we need I know, everything. I know. I think. I know. But it, the question I think I Marilyn presented the, the question in the right way. It, 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 I know. The question is, you know, obviously you need personnel. Um, I mean, but personnel, are you going to hire personnel that, that works directly with kids? Are you going to you going to emphasize that over personnel that works with teachers? Um, that that's a tough question. And obviously, yes, we we do we do see the benefit of hiring, you know, instructional coaches. But 
as you heard the principals talk about class sizes. So when you got class sizes going up, you know, how do you prioritize hiring coaches when teachers are teaching more kids in their classrooms? What so is our average class size? It's, it's a balance. Um, I, I would say our average class size of the elementary schools is about 20 to uh, 22 to 25. Yeah. You know, that's quite a bit. 22 is okay, but 25 is pushing. Well, you got kindergarten classrooms with 25 kids in them. That's yeah. a lot. I um, high school, What's you're 25 to 30. Wow. You know, middle schools, you know, anywhere between 25 to 32. I mean, nice. so it personnel, you guys know this. Personnel is the biggest part of our budget. And, um, you know, it's a reoccurring cost. Yeah, of course. And it's a, reincur it's a reoccurring cost that goes up every year because obviously people deserve raises and so forth. So these are things that, that, that we have to look at. And trust me, cutting $15 million is not, not an easy thing to do. It was, it was, it was, it was terrible this year, um, cutting that down. So, um, you know, we do see the benefit in instructional coaches but we do have to measure that benefit with everything else that we need in our school district. I see, I see where you supplement it with teacher to teacher. I get it. I mean, uh, yeah, we do the best, the best we can with these other services. And, of course. And, and we do a lot with, um, through Sayreville University. We have a new teacher institute. As a matter of fact, this evening, you're going to be approving some of our veteran experienced teachers to present to our workshops to our newest teachers during years one, two, and three. So we have an ongoing thing where we may not be able to hire instructional coaches, but we do work with our teachers to tr try to provide them with as much support as we can give them. And if you look at um, some of the titles of some of the workshops, which are being approved tonight, you'll see that, that th they're designed to support our newer teachers. And um, our instructional coach from the middle school is actually presenting a number of those new teacher workshops for us, which will benefit teachers outside of the middle school, too. Thank you. So Rick, if, if the principals had, if we had the money to give the principals the teachers they needed, do we have the room? <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm thinking they needed no. help in the class, and you're no. saying they want another class, different class. Exactly. Hey, Dale, uh, that's, so I mean, the, there's the, there, that's just that? another element that, that we have to contend with, ergonomics. We just don't have the space in our buildings for the, the additional staff. Um, but as you know, with every budget cycle that comes up, it's the it's to prevailing request. We, we want more staff and, and obviously we understand the need we you know if we could we'd hire as many people as we you know as we possibly you know could if we had the space for them and we had the money to but We've been lucky. We've been fortunate over the past several years because we've been getting equalization aid. And that equalization aid has allowed us to go ahead and increase our staff. I'll never forget when I first got here, um, the limited staff we had. And we've grown exponentially, our staff. But I keep warning everyone, the board, our administration, that there's going to come a year, whether it's this year or next year, that we're not going to receive any more equalization aid. So we, be, we have to be extremely careful about hiring additional staff because that's a reoccurring cost. And because you got equalization aid this year, you want to hire two or three more people with benefits. Now you're going to have to incur that extra cost next year, especially when they're getting increases according to whatever collective bargaining unit they're in. So it, gets dangerous and that train is going to stop and it's going to stop either this year or next year. That's why Aaron and I are on pins and needles waiting to see what our aid is going to be from the state. Are we going to get equalization aid this year? And we're hoping that we do, but if we don't, that means it's, it's over. A lot of districts are telling me that it's over. Um, you know, some districts got a lot of money last year and they were told that's it. We weren't told that, so we, we have our fingers and toes crossed that we're going to get additional equalization aid this year. But will we get it next year? I would bet not. So we have to be very careful. We understand how important it is to hire additional staff for one reason or the other.
but we're going to run into the same problem that we ran into this year when you're you you balance the budget based upon last year's revenue and you're 15 million dollars over you've got to make some very tough choices in terms of what you cut and the last thing in the world anybody in this room wants to cut is staff existing staff so you just have to be really careful about personnel what do what are we going to do when the funding for the preschool runs out like how are we going to fund that well i i they they have assured us to this point that that's not going to happen that's going to be something that's but you know what i mean you raise a you raise a good question because the change in administration i mean you know as soon as governor murphy's you know <coughs> term is over his his second term he can you know he can't so it, it, a change in government the next governor that comes in could say you know what we don't want to provide that money any longer for preschools Bad uh, optic. then Bad we'll optic. be in an incredibly difficult situation but we'll have to cross that bridge when we get there as of right now governor murphy has committed to continue to fund preschool while he's still in administration But a very good question and something else that keeps me up at night, <laughs> among many other things, <laughs> including Mrs. Labby. <laughs> story. EMI. Oh, I didn't mean it that way. <laughs> 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 Any other questions? Uh, yeah, Dr. I, I just got one question. Yeah, sure. really, I know we don't have the funds for it, it's more for my own edification. Obviously, I, ideal world, you would take. 30 kid classroom, break it up into two separate classrooms, 15 each. How much of a drop off is it from having two separate classrooms at 15 each, opposed to having two teachers in one classroom for 30 kids? Um, or is there a value? I don't, I don't, I, I, I guess the, the question I'm gonna ask you in order to answer your question is, what do you mean by a, a classroom with 30 kids in it and two teachers? Are you talking about an in-class resource center class? Well, I mean. Because we I don't have classes where we have two teachers in them unless it's an in-class resource center classroom where there's a special education teacher and a general education teacher. Right, I, I, I'm not referring to, to those, because those are obviously different skill sets, different uh, issues. Just in terms of, obviously in an, an ideal world, we all want. So in an ideal world, what would be, what would be more manageable? I, I, I guess, I mean, I guess you would, I guess you would overcome that barrier of space right, if you were to put we, 30 we, we kids in a classroom with two teachers. That, yeah. Right. That's what I'm saying. We, we obviously don't have the physical space to right. double to, to cut so our class So you would in overcome half. that by putting so, two teachers. Right. So yeah, my question that is, would, would you cut the workload in half? Yes. I mean, and obviously that wouldn't be as effective as having two separate classrooms. But my question is, is it like a 10% drop off or is it like a 70% drop off? Or do we even have an idea of what? I mean, I'm, know, I'm not even sure what, what drop off there would be. I mean, in essence, what you're trying to do is lower the teacher to student ratio. And you would be doing that if you had two teachers in a classroom with 30 kids. Okay, so you feel it would be fairly. So I think that possible. would be pretty much equivalent to a teacher teaching 15 kids. <coughs> it would be equivalent to that. Okay. So I don't think there would be much of a drop off. Gotcha. But again, we're, we go back to that question of <coughs> do we have the fiscal ability no, to do right. something right. like that. I, I understand that. I, I just wanted to get a comprehension yeah. of, is it somewhat comparable I think, I think it'd be a wash. Two, two separate classes, or is it the drop off so, so dramatic you wouldn't even want to think about it? No, I think it would be pretty much a wash. Mm -hmm. If you had the space, you would go with the smaller class. Mm -hmm. uh, if, you would, if you didn't have the space, you would go with the, the larger class with two teachers. Anyone else? Any yeah, questions? One, one quick question. Sure. So with the change of the high school, LAL curriculum to the HMH. That's replacing the current, what, Pontus and Pinnell no. curriculum? No, not the high or school. Is, is what's in the high school at, now? at the high school, we use, a, <coughs> um, we've written our own curriculum and we don't have a packaged program. Okay. We use novels, short stories. We don't have a real solid, our writing program really needs to be more integrated in with the reading and writing and the nice thing about the HMH program is that it uses a lot of the same novels that we already use. And it's just, it's something that will bring more consistency. We are actually piloting it in several classrooms. Some, we just started 
in j uh, towards the end of January, se several teachers volunteered. So to it would be it. pretty comfortable for the staff to adopt and not need a lot of training on or right. service on. Right, and and they do provide. They've already provided some staff development, and they they would pr provide more. They will come in on June sixth and do training, which is our second professional development that day we started this year, which is great. This is exactly what it's right. for. So. They, they would come in and do that. I mean, they're they're very anxious to to work with us. Great. Then who cut that? I don't know. <laughs> well, hey, but but you put back two you two grade levels, so I was very happy. <laughs> well, I, I can live with spreading it out. I didn't tell you, Aaron. I changed our mind about that too. No, yeah. <laughs> I know you have metrics, that. right? To, to see, I know you have metrics to see if things work or not. How often do you do them? I mean, are you like how do you know if this is going to be successful? Year one, year two, how, how do you determine this? Oh, I think you got to go at least five years. You, you've got to, you, you would have to go a few years, you know, okay. to see. I mean, because. Do you it, measure, the, uh, measure each year? Most. The progress, whether we're right, going right. The right we, we would, but, you know, if we're doing it for the ninth, you know, if, if we implement it in ninth grade and in eleventh grade, which is if it remains at only half of it. Yeah. So, and the reason why we selected those grades <laughs> to start with is because we have the state testing at those grade levels. So we thought that do, it would okay. Do we lose a lot though between a ninth grade and an 11th grader if we're not doing it in 10th grade? But our hope is that the following year we're going She's to She's hoping that we're going to yeah. put it you're in You're hoping you get the whole package. Come on, uh, come, on come on, come on, Mr. <laughs> the Smith. The equalization aid goes she's, away. She's very coy. You don't get she's it. very coy. Right. <laughs> uh, I, 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 then I will come back to you next year with the exactly. argument. Well, well, how could we not continue it on? Yes. And, and this is how we adopted Fontes and Pinnell. We started, we did like two grade <clears> levels at a time so that, you know, we started in kindergarten and first grade. The following year we moved it up to second and third grade, and then it got a little messed up because of COVID, but we did it so that once a student started in it, they stayed in it, so. But to answer Mr. Esposito's question, if you look at most research, it's longitudinal. Um, to truly get an idea of how effective anything is that you're doing in education, it takes about 10 years to really to chart that out. But the uh, math doesn't work for me, and I, I'm not <laughs> questioning because I'm not obviously a non-educator, but if you institute this in ninth grade, it has to benefit them in year two in high school, doesn't it? I mean, how do we take 10 years it's, to see if you, it There's a difference between it. has to benefit and measuring it. So your, your question was, are we able to measure it um, at, a, measure it on the at a significant level? We can, but you want to be able to say that it was, you want to be able to isolate that it was that that made the child perform better. Okay, I got you. Because there are so many variables involved with the performance of a child. So you're trying to isolate what is it that's enabling that child to perform so well. That's why you need that longitudinal data. Okay. Over time, different teachers and so forth, that will show you a pattern of success that you need. Um, a good example of it is we're, we're approaching, I think, year seven <coughs> with um, ST Math. Mm -hmm. And if it wasn't for the pandemic, we were getting great results in terms of measuring how well kids would perform on the NJSLA if they met all their target areas in ST math. Um, the pandemic threw a monkey wrench into that because of the fact that, you know, that all that data was skewed and we didn't test and so forth. So, and that's the same case with a lot of the programs that we have. That's another thing that people don't talk about with the pandemic. It really harmed our ability to see what we were doing. Um, is it effective or not? But it, it goes back to consistency, and I think that um, Dr. Shediak does, has done an amazing job with that, as all of our administrators and our teachers that have been a part of some of these decisions. You know, when you go ahead and you identify a program that you want to implement, you have to stick with it. So you have to pick a program, you know, in the right way. You have to make good decisions based on data and, 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 and other information that, that you might have to select a program, but then you gotta stick with it. So your teachers get better with it uh, and, and, and you were able to collect that data. You'll see that the districts that really struggle are the ones that are continuously changing their programs and they're never giving any one program an opportunity to you know, be in execution for more than three or four years. And I think that's key. 
I got you. I, I understand what you're saying. I really do. But you have to. You can't wait ten years. Is there a way? How how do we do it? Because I really don't know. How do we know? Like year four, I don't know. I don't. Know if, we're gonna stick with it, but I don't know if it's that good. Year yeah, six, look, we're not. We're not. This is not working, guys. We're gonna go to ten. What do we cut our losses at six? I said the optimal is 10. That's when you I, really I, I, see. I but, I, but we are measuring. We're constantly measuring. We're constantly looking. But again, that's why you don't make these decisions, you know, you don't make knee, you know, yeah, yeah. knee jerk reactions and, and split decisions. I would hope the program is pretty researched out. Right. You, you've got to you've got to take the time to do your research and, and, and commit on something. <coughs> I mean, you know this in the private industry. It takes years for companies to go ahead and make a decision to change with something yeah. um, because it, it's such an investment and, and the, we look at the, those things the same way we realize that um, you, you go ahead and purchase a program like this you're gonna have to train the teachers you can invest in all this um, you're not going to go ahead and do that in a program that you're like eh, maybe it'll work maybe it won't you have to really believe based upon your research of it that it's going to work but then yet you got to take the time and and collect the data measure the data and I'm telling you, you got to at least wait five years to see if you're going to get the fruit um, that, that you're, you're, you're planning to get with that labor. Sure. Um, Ten years is what they say is what you really need to make a definitive um, determination of the efficacy of the program. Gotcha, gotcha. But you know yeah. what I'm saying? When I, I do, I got it. Executive management, yeah. I got to tell them throughout the time, look, this is working, guys, working or not working. Well, and explain my explain why right. If it's a, if it's a, if it, if, you, if it's a disaster to begin with, I yeah. mean, then then you know you, you you're, you're going to get those signs, um, but um, there's a lot of variables at play All right. when you're, you're implementing. That's what I'm saying. Someone's at the controls looking yeah. at this the whole but way, right? I, there's something there. Um, I would like to say, isn't the fact that our math scores are very low, like, isn't that an indicator that whatever we're doing is it's been that's been for many years, like isn't that an indicator that we need to reevaluate or? Well, actually our math scores were increasing right. prior to the pandemic. Um, it, in, I would say close to significantly. We, yeah. we were seeing significant improvement in pandemic. our math scores. The pandemic kind of killed us. But, and that's the hard part. I mean, the, the pandemic really did, um, you know, we don't talk about that much, but it, it really did throw a wrench into everything that we were doing. Right. They, they've been low for a long time. So, and would we be happy with a tiered rollout of social studies? We could live with that. Yes, we could. <laughs> we, we, we ask for, what, you know. <laughs> yeah. You ask for everything. Right, you get right, what you want. right. Honestly, gotcha. yes. We, we, we understand that it may be a tiered rollout, and we've, we've done that. That's how we've done programs largely <laughs> over, the, over a number of years. Would it be nice to be able to do it all at once and do all the PD and, and so on? Absolutely, but we are also realistic mm -hmm. and we understand. You know, I see where we're saying, oh, we're doing, we're improving, we're doing AP this and calculus and all this stuff. I don't see a real concentration for the kids who are not either, they're all in special services and they're not supersonically smart. What about all those kids in the middle? What are we doing to help them accelerate? And that's what Dr. Shedrick was speaking about earlier, ASI, <laughs> hiring ASI teachers. Yeah, but we're, we can't do that because we can't afford it. So what else are we doing? Like we, well, we are have doing been. things for the we, other kids. We've hired, I think we've hired four or five over the past. Well, you just said that you couldn't. Well, we, we hired. Why you couldn't well, well, we hired. Well, right now, yeah. Right. Right now in this yeah, but budget. what are we doing right now okay. for the we kids are in that big segment? Okay. They're yeah. either, they don't have special needs, but right. they also are not and, on and AP courses. And that was addressed um, in the student learning gaps. Right. If you look at our presentation. St student learning gaps. We are providing our students with an enormous amount of services. Would we like to provide more? Absolutely. And, you know, we ha in addition to the ASI program, we have the summer learning acceleration, which we are inviting our students to come to in K through five. We are doing um, before and after school academies. At the middle school, we found that not every child could get there for the before school academy because of transportation, but the middle school has a late bus. So we are also offering the option of an after school academy for math and literacy that students can opt to attend. We, they have the opportunity room at both the middle school and at the high school. We're doing tier three interventions, which are 
either one on, one to one or one to two uh, teacher to student ratio, and those are prescribed for the students through the RTI program. And these are students who are not classified, you know, and they're not your a generally they're not your AP students and your higher achieving students. But we are offering that we offer it during the school day, during the student's lunch period, one to two days a week. We offer it before school, after school. So, so we're trying to hit them, as Dr. Labby has always said, with the kitchen sink. We're, you know, so those students who are going to, they may see the ASI teacher during the school day. They may go to Math or Literacy Academy before or after school. They may have some tier three, one-on-one -on -one tutoring once or twice a week. They're invited to summer learning acceleration. We're I, I do have to say this, the academies, the language and the math one, you're doing before and after school now, and Camp XL in the summertime, being very familiar with them, have done really good things. Yeah. I mean, we're, 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 we're trying every which way we can to provide services <coughs> for those students, because, you know, that, that's where the learning gaps are occurring, and we really want to support those students. You know, and the other thing that Dr. Shadak spoke about earlier, it, and it, it needs to be spoken about as much as possible is professional development. Um, the number one factor in learning is the effectiveness of the teacher. You know, we're talking about this new high school program. It fails in comparison to how important the teacher is. Yeah, programs like that are important, but by far the most important factor in learning will always be the teacher. So it's inherently important for us to continue to invest monies into professionally developing our staff. Not only giving them the tools they need with those programs and resources, but developing their pedagogical and instructional skills. And, and that's another thing that was mentioned um, that, you know, that's in her budget as, in, as well as in um, Dr. Aguilis' presentation on what we're doing. But, but that is huge as well, especially when you look at the fact that the pandemic has caused such a great deal of attrition on school districts. And ours, look at the number of retirees that we've had within the past three years and contributed most, mostly to, to the, the pandemic. So you have these incredibly talented teachers who have been teaching for many, many years, and <coughs> rightly so, they're retiring. And we're replacing them with newer teachers, less experienced teachers. That is a contributing factor as well in the performance of our students. They're great teachers, but you can't compare a teacher that's been teaching one or two years with a teacher that's been teaching 25 years. Just the, that wealth of knowledge, wisdom, and experience um, that goes into you know, their instruction, you, you just can't compare the two. So it becomes very important for us to make sure that we're giving all the professional development and support to our newer teachers so that we can continue to progress our students like the teachers were that have left us. Right, and coaches are ideal, and we could argue that, but I think they are, and we can't afford them. Professional development, so your supervisors give you the ideas? How does it filter out? Teachers, supervisors, you? Yes. You come up with them? Anyone? Yeah. It doesn't matter. Yeah, it's, it, 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 it's many different it's sources. It's a lot of collaboration. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah I, I meet with the supervisors every month. As a whole, I speak to them all the time. Uh -huh. You know, when they say to me, well, I'd like to bring you know, Dr. Milo in to do some math workshops with yeah. the middle school and high school teachers, and I say, okay, send, send me an email with the information. Right. Mr. Howard and I talk weekly about ideas of things to do for professional development. You know, the supervisors are continually coming to me, and, you know, we, we have these conversations all the time, and, and they talk to teachers about it, and, yeah. We yeah. just, it, it's a very collaborative effort. That's great, it should be. It, it is. Should be. And we're talking measurables real quick before. How do we know PD's working? How do, how do we know what we did worked? Do we ever follow up on that stuff? Or I know you guys are busy and short staff, but how do we know what To we the best of our stuff? ability, yeah. I mean, we follow up with, with surveys, we ask teachers during, the supervisors have department meetings and or grade level meetings, and they will ask teachers to share things that they learned at maybe an outside workshop they went to. We have, a lot of our teachers will come back and turnkey. I mean, if, I don't know if you recall, but during our, for our staff development day back in November, we had 
many of our teachers who actually presented at the workshops. And, great. and who, who better you know, to great. present yeah. than our own staff members. We, for things that, professional Thank development you. that we do internally, we send out surveys and we ask for feedback we, um, for the different workshops that we present in-house. We got away from, but we're, Mr. Howard and I are working on bringing back full day Sayreville University workshops right here in the district so teachers don't have to go out for it. We had been doing more of that pre-pandemic, but you know we stopped that because of the pandemic, but we are getting back to that. So yeah, we're, we've been working with New Jersey teacher to teacher for years and th they do a lot with our literacy coaches. We're talking about possibly bringing them into the high school to work with some of the teachers at the high school. Yeah, to piggyback on Eileen's question before, yeah. so if we're deficient, let's say we're deficient in reading and writing for argument's sake, do we gear our professional development to those types of teachers to say, hey, try these, diff that we're, we're again, coaches mm -hmm. are ideal yes. in these situations, right? Do we gear mm -hmm. our professional development to you know, yes. hone in on that? Yes, we yes, okay. and, and th that's why we started a number of years ago with bringing in a New Jersey teacher to teacher, for example, and why we're doing love of literacy through the special ed department because we felt that that was an area that we needed some, some additional work in. And we also, when we observe teachers, we often make recommendations to them in the final write-up recommending workshops for them to attend based on what may have been observed during the class. Right. So, and and we, we track what workshops teachers go to and um, so on. So, thanks. And while we do collect data on, on just about everything that we do, just understand that, again, it's very hard. And I'm waiting for some company to come up with some type of algorithm that will determine how effective one thing is in promoting learning for a child. Because there are so many variables that go into play when you're teaching a child. First of all, all the variables that you control as a school or a teacher or a district, but then all the variables that you can't control about the student, the home life, the environment outside of school. So there are a ton of variables that you just cannot control when you're educating children. So it's very, very difficult to be able to isolate any one thing that you're doing to determine how truly effective it is on promoting learning. We do the best we can to determine holistically and systemically what it is that we believe is effective or not, but it's very difficult. It's and and I would science. love for some, somebody to create an algorithm where you could take all the different variables that go into educating a child or children and determine how effective each one of those things are. And correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Labby, all those variables that are outside the school, as you mentioned, those are the biggest factors in, in a child's learning, more so than, than anything we can control here. Yeah. Oh, in, yes. I mean, incredibly so. I mean, and more, 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 more ever now in, in this current world that we live in, we have so many kids that have experienced what we call um, childhood trauma experiences and what we learned about trauma is it inhibits your ability to learn the greater the trauma the the more inhibition so i mean it's it, it's difficult but um what david help me out with it. the aces what does the aces stand for adverse childhood experiences adverse childhood experiences there's a list of 10 or 15 it it's 10? actually a rating scale in line with what you were saying before that you were dreaming about, um, in which you, you, you receive points for each type of trauma that you might have been exposed to or so experienced. And if, you, if you've experienced, I think, five of them, you're considered highly susceptible um, to not being able to, to not only having psychological problems, but even physical problems as you grow up. Um, and you'd be shocked at some of those those adverse childhood experiences, divorce, domestic abuse, 
um, you know, just to name a few, think about our kids and the, you know, the adverse childhood experiences they have and the number of kids that have had at least five. So um, there are a lot of variables, Mr. Fernandez, that we're not in control of, um, that, that we have to work around or in spite of to educate our kids, and it's more so than ever. And, and again, you're, you're the expert. Well, again, correct me if I'm wrong. I think we point out the obvious, most traumatic ones, but in terms of a child learning, I think it goes even far beyond that, beyond our control. Whether a parent spends time uh, doing homework with the child, or whether the parent's educational level has a huge right. impact from the data I, I've, I've read. And if I'm wrong, please. Uh, no, you're me, absolutely right. The factors outside of the school are so much greater than, than what we can control here. Obviously, we do what we can here. But it's a, it's a great job that our teachers do with all the other factors that are, that are out of their control. I agree. I would just like to say, on behalf of the parents who do not have an education, that does not mean that their child's going to poor, perform poorly in school. A lot of people who, not, who have not had an education themselves produce uh, children who go on to be very successful and have. So it's not a matter of uh, the education of the parent regardless of how the children are going to succeed. Well, I don't, I don't think, I don't want to speak for Mr. Fernandez. I don't think he was saying that. I, I think what he was because saying that's is. that's a negative factor. Well, what I was, I think he was saying is that there are some parents that don't have either the ability, you know, so maybe they work two jobs. They don't have the ability to read with their child at night. There's just a lot of Or maybe they speak English, uh, they, they don't speak very good English, and they don't have the opportunity to help with writing and so forth. So. I think that you know all of our parents are different. Some are quite capable of helping their children at home. Some might not be. Yeah, but Correct. I think Thank you, the the, I don't think it has. It's a negative thing. All those things. I've, I've, I'm married to a man who has eleven brothers. His mother spoke barely any English, and his entire family is very successful. So I don't think that's that's a negative impact on how the child. There's other things, economic things, family life, relationships divorces, things like that, but the very fact that the parent themselves has a different language or didn't have a college education or even maybe an eight, or when didn't even complete elementary does not mean that that child is destined to fail. I don't, I don't believe anyone said that any one of these factors means a child is destined to fail. Even if a child's been through one of the traumatic experiences that we're talking about, means that any individual is, is destined to fail. We've seen individuals in many walks of life overcome a great many number of traumas. What we're talking about is, is statistically um, the factors that could impact or possibly have an impact on a uh, child's success. Not that, that's a, that that will or will not determine any one individual. And so does a parent success. who went to Rutgers and has a yes, master's degree and doesn't pay attention to their kids. I mean, you know. So let's lighten up the mood a little bit and have Dr. Shediak oh, go over to start strong <laughs> results. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, we talked a little bit about Start Strong a few meetings ago when a parent came up and asked some questions. Our students took the Start Strong exam back in the fall, early October. So let me just tell you a little bit about what Start Strong is to refresh your memory um, from a few weeks ago. It's basically Start Strong Assessment was developed in response to the disruption in education caused by the pandemic, and it was actually designed specifically to inform instruction moving forward. First time it was administered was in 2021, in the fall of 2021. Thus all students are described they assume that they're all going to need some kind of support. It's not meeting expectations. Nobody's <coughs> exceeding expectations. They're assuming everyone's going to need some kind of support. So the levels are um, basically need some support, needs more support, needs a lot of support. Um, and they do s caution that the results of the Start Strong, and I want you to keep remembering this as we're going through these statistics, that it should only be used with other supporting evidence, such as assignments, homework, et cetera, when, you're dr when drawing conclusions about 
a student's overall academic performance. As we said at the meeting a few weeks ago, it's, it's one data point that we use among many. So it's scored by, again, like I said, that support may definitely, it's going to be needed, less support, some support, or strong support. It's, the questions are either correct, they're incorrect, or they give partial credit. Students in grades four through 10 were tested. Math in grades four through eight, um, algebra one, algebra two, and geometry students. Science in grades six, nine, and 12. And it was based on standards from the previous year, okay, from the year prior. So for example, the grade five start strong assessment in language arts was aligned to a small subset of the grade four language arts standards. Okay, it's not an extensive set of standards. They're just looking at some priority standards. So it's not, it doesn't have the breadth of something like the NJSLA or even our own in district assessments like the Lincoln benchmarks. Algebra one starts strong as aligned to the eighth grade learning standards that are relevant to the algebra concepts. Okay, it's not designed, Start Strong is not designed to predict future student performance on the NJSLA, nor was it designed to estimate what a student might score if they had taken the NJSLA. Well, we know that this past spring, the students did take the NJSLA, so we have that data. It's not a summative assessment of student learning following a period of instruction. It does not cover the full breadth and depth of the student learning standards. This is all right from the state. This is what the state's telling us. Districts should not compare any student, school, or district data to any other state level data for Start Strong nor should it be compared to the NJSLA, and they really don't want us comparing a district to district. So, just to give you an idea. So with that, I will move forward and I will go over all of the results. Now, for the board on the first, and for anyone who's watching, the first page are the numbers, the number of students tested, the percent of students who fall into each category. The next page gives that same information, but in a chart form, which is probably a lot easier to decipher and read. I, I find them a lot easier. And I also want to include the fact that we are required by the state to report all this data to the board and the public and to give all of the demographic <coughs> data that's going to come in the upcoming slides, okay? So we're not trying to. So what were they kill. trying to measure here? Because they, they are trying to measure the, how students did, how student, students' understanding and achievement of some standards from the previous year. They initially started this in response to the pandemic because in the spring of 2020, when COVID first happened, we did not do any state assessments right. when we normally would. So then that fall is when they started to do this to give us an idea of we had to have something, they felt, and they were trying to measure. So if you look at the graph or the chart, here we have in the green obviously is less support may be needed in the yellowish orange is some support and the red is strong <coughs> support is needed. So this is the English language arts overall total students for grades four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and then the one all the way to the right is the composite of all the grades. <coughs> Yeah, yeah so when you add up the need support, <coughs> need support and some support, it's a high number. Well, so hopefully I mean, this don't mean a lot, these tests, because the scores are horrible. 
like when you add them up, mm -hmm. like for example, grade eight math, well, 55%. Okay, but, but, but don't jump ahead to oh, math. Okay, sorry. Okay. <laughs> well, like if you add those two things up, that every single one beats the less support number except for grade five ELA. That, that the green is better than. Well, the grade, grade, nine, grade nine ELA. Grade 10 ELA, it's about equal. Well, if, I, if I'm looking at the ELA. If you add the grade nine ELA together, the support where they need support, it's 50%, which is higher than 48%. Statistically, that's, there's really no But we, we, unfortunately, we, te we teach our kids to test, right? right? That's what we do. It's right. like a machine. So we didn't, did, am I wrong in the other, the other scores that, you know, we, we work all year so they can take the test and do well on it. Did we do anything to prepare for this? I mean, or, well, the students. Or should they have known it anyways, the kind of basic stuff? The, what, what is tested here was taught the year before. Hmm. What was tested here was taught the previous school year. This, okay. this assessment was administered at the beginning of October. So. Gotcha, understood. Okay. So the next part is math, the overall math. And then we go on to the chart the for the math. 9% um, of the high school kids would not, would need a little assistance. Well, I mean, and the, the, the other part of that you have to understand with this assessment, you know, it's not a high stakes test for the students either. You know, NJSLA scores are used to determine placement in classes. So were they this told don't not, worry about this test? It doesn't mean anything? I so, highly doubt it. Uh, <laughs> some, some may or not. Our teachers would actually tell the students. No. No, nobody said don't that. Don't worry about this test. No, no, the students know that they don't need it as much. Right. Really? I don't think that's more the students. Right. I don't think the students know the difference between standardized tests. Like, so I don't agree the, with the, that. The older students the older often students do. When you're a high school student and you know if a test is going to get you into college or not, you know the difference. Uh, it's just very simple. So only 9% of them paid attention. Oof. We well, that well the, st the students in high school algebra one are our less mathematically inclined students. The majority of our students take algebra one in the middle school. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the students who so they should be prepared. Be no, but they're no, not no, taking they algebra one in high school. Once. My daughter took algebra every single year. Yeah, but algebra no. one, algebra two. Yeah, she did. Al algebra one is only offered. And then she took algebra in high school. Well, then she took out. If she took algebra one in middle school, she would have taken algebra two in the high school. Mm -hmm. Yes, and algebra two is there at the end. Right. Yes. Yeah, it's the same. They were all good poorly. These are just. I'm just hoping that you're right that these tests didn't mean anything because the scores are horrendous. But. Like I said, it's only one data point. I mean, and if, if you want, you can go back and I can even send you the no. presentation that I that was done in the fall on the NJSLA scores, which were, they were not great, but it was better than this. Um, and yes. And we, this is also following COVID and all that. Right, so. right, and we admit, we, we know there's learning gaps and we know we have to work with our students. And that's what we're doing, and we're working on that every single day. Now, I know you mentioned earlier that we this isn't meant to be compared to other districts, but just have something to, 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 to for, 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 as a reference point. How do we rate versus the rest of the county or the rest of the state? Well, since they don't want us to compare ourselves to other districts, it's very hard to find that information. Okay. But the information that I did find indicates that we're right about in the middle. We're not. So this isn't going to be a regular test that's administered? We don't know if it's going to be administered again. Did we learn anything from it? Did we, we learned a little bit. On, 
it, why the math is low or whatever. It, it, it's yeah, one, the math is horrendous. It, it, it's one data point. And we yeah, know that the it. math, and that. we know that the math suffered more than the language arts due to COVID because of the nature of how math is taught. If a child, if during the COVID year, if a child was in fifth grade, fifth grade is largely focused on fractions. Well, fractions is a very, very important foundation for algebra. So if the students missed out on good quality instruction on fractions in fifth grade, they're going to be at a disadvantage, a little bit of a disadvantage going into algebra one, you know, and, and we know that. And that's why we keep trying to offer all of this support and really work with the students, identify the students. And, you know, one thing we did use this data for is we were able to further identify more students. We, when we got these results, we got them around, I think, the beginning of December or so when we first received them. Well, the supervisors took those results and they started to, now we have a second round of academies that just started in January. Well, they used results from here to add students to the academies because, okay, this child didn't do too badly on the NJSLA, so they were not initially invited to an academy back in September. But now that we got these results and if, if a student tanked on this, then that student will likely be invited to participate in one of the academies. So, you know, we're, we're using it in that way. I mean, we use, we give benchmarks three times a year, link it benchmarks, and we use that, those benchmarks to determine, again, what students might need further support and assistance. So we do use this, but this is not the only thing we use. We use it along with the students' grades in the classroom, test grades, and the NJSLA and the benchmarks. Right, I'm sure we, we identified the students that did very poorly in fractions, right? And we all know how, right, like you pointed out, it's important for algebra. And we also know that math is like a building, right? If you don't, you know, one floor is bad, you're done. You can't build on it. Did we, what did we do for those specific kids? Did we put them in a, in a not a, a basic skills uh, class in eighth, ninth, eighth, ninth grade it would be, I guess? Yes. Or whatever, and just make sure they know that before they go on to any algebra, despite what they may want to do. Okay, so, so what we do is students are identified, and if we're talking about the high school, yeah, you know, so we look at the students and we take a look at what they did on NJSLA, their classroom grades, and their benchmarks, and then those students at the high school level, whether it be in math or language arts, and we do have more students who we do this for in math because of the, the way, again, math is built on the foundation, those students take an extra semester of math. So they will get math 104 as a freshman. So in addition to taking algebra one, they're getting in a smaller class setting, which is usually anywhere from 12 to 15 students, they're getting a semester, an additional semester of math. So they're then right, parallel with algebra one. Correct. That's hard. That's got to be hard to do. But it, it's designed to support. Sure, them. I get it. I get it. And yeah, sure. you know, some of the students aren't too happy about that because okay. it means cuts back on their electives. Mm -hmm. But it's something that we say, no, you have to do. We this. don't give a choice. No. Good. No, okay. we don't give a choice. We we were lucky. I mean, we were pretty forward thinking. I think, and our kids came back to school a little bit earlier. Right. than yeah. a lot of other Middlesex yeah. County school districts. COVID is a reality. We know there was a learning gap during COVID, especially in math. I see it in my own kids. I, mm -hmm. I know it's a very real thing. The academies we're doing, these extra classes we're doing, how best guest estimates, when is that deficiency gonna be non-existent anymore are we talking three years from now five years from now kids that started in kindergarten and it's going to be 10 years from now at some point we got to stop using the COVID excuse right and and you know what that there will always be a deficiency there there will always be some students who have a deficiency 
and there always has been. Yes. We've always had ASI math. We've all we've Absolutely. had for years since I don't know. I'm tell fifteen years or so. We've had the the, the literacy and the math academies. Mm -hmm. So there's always been a deficiency. Yeah, but like we have more we're of about this year. We have six hundred kids in one of the programs that pre-COVID we had two hundred kids. Right. In. Right. And you know what? We're hoping that those numbers will go down. But if, as long as we have the capacity to offer it to the students, what we do is we actually expand and offer it to more students. So we, we um, throw out a wider net for the students. So whereas, you know, we, we will take in more students, you know, just to, to give kids support, you know? And when we invite students to the academies and if for some reason they turn it down, well then we have a list. We have like a wait list of, okay, who are the next ones we're going to invite? So it, <clears throat> we expect that we will continue to provide these supports for the students. Uh, you know? I'm, I'm like, I think we're in the same boat. On, I, and an educator will never tell you this, but I don't think they're ever gonna make it up. Yeah, I, I just don't. I, don't I think, think kindergarten, the kids are in kindergarten this year are probably, you know, going to be the I think. first. Yeah. I know you'll never admit it. You know, no, one, no one will. But how <laughs> no, and, I, and I appreciate all the support up. you're giving these kids. But I, I do. I, I just have to wonder. Oh, I, I, th I, think, I think we will overcome it. I do. Well, I'm determined. I we think will. if you didn't, we wouldn't be happy with your performance. <laughs> right. <laughs> no. I'm I, I think the best analogy I've heard to describe what our kids are going through right now as a result of the pandemic is if you can picture someone walking upstairs, you know, walking up a set of stairs as they're growing, right, and learning. The pandemic can be best, the best metaphor I've heard is now they're walking upstairs but on an escalator that's going down. So they have to work even harder to get it. If you've ever walked, tried to walk up an escalator going down, it's very difficult. And that's what some of our kids have to do now in order to catch up because they've lost learning. So now they have to continue to learn, but actually learn at a, at a, at a higher pace. They gotta accelerate in order to get where they were. And again, if you've ever done that as a kid, walked up, you know, escalators going down it's incredibly hard and some some can do it but but some may not be able to and that's probably the best analogy i've heard with regard to the impact the pandemic has had on our children no that's a great way of describing it well thank you very much <laughs> <laughs> Take some <leave. laughs> okay so <coughs> Moving forward to science. In the next section, I, we break down every assessment by the, um, by different subgroups, the first, subgroup is race. Again, it's, it's much easier to see on the chart. And this is language arts based on race. Well, I, I think it I think it affected all of them. Okay, the next one is math by race. Of 
science by race. Then we go into gender by the gender. This is language arts by gender. Now we all know that women are smarter than <laughs> some other people. That was so why are we failing? <laughs> I'm to see why are girls? Uh, you know, we're not doing as good as the guys. What else I Maybe it's for a what? For language arts? For math. For math. For math. For math, well, we didn't. I didn't get to math. <laughs> <laughs> jumping ahead. Keep jumping ahead. Because <laughs> I'm quick. We got him in language arts. Don't need to in, in language like arts, the females the scored better. Yeah. Okay, so then we go to the math by gender. And science by gender. Can I just reiterate, Marilyn, for anybody who's listening that gets offended by the gender and the race piece, that this is required by the state. This is the way the state <coughs> wants us to break this down. This is not our choice. Correct. Thank you. Correct. Next is by program for language arts, for free and reduced lunch. 504, ELL, <coughs> special education, and general education. <coughs> and then we have math by program, same five programs. Science by program. And that's it. I mean, I think the last several slides really depict the inequities uh, that, you know, the pandemic isolated mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, how incredibly difficult it was during the pandemic for our kids that speak English as a second language to, to learn in a hybrid way, um, as well as our children with disabilities, and then our kids that are socioeconomically disadvantaged. Um, while we were providing devices and mobile hotspots, they may not have had a place where in which um, they had consistent Wi-Fi or a, a separate place to, you know, take part in, in, in their classes and so forth within their households. So I think those last few pages are the most powerful of this presentation in terms of um, how difficult it was for some of our students particularly our students that speak English as a second language, our children with disabilities, and our socioeconomically disadvantaged kids. Any other questions for Dr. Shediak? Yes, why did you take longer than Mr. Glock Malloy? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Sorry. Good job, yeah. Thank you. Eric, you're off the hook. Well, I'm happy to see there's no retirements in the agenda. Coming oh, no. Up. no, there's, oh, there's, there's two. two. There's oh, two. Is there? oh, I missed that. We warned you. Oh, you've we been talking you. to Mr. Smith has been talking to Mr. Walsh. We warned you. Okay. I guess that wraps up presentations, Dr. Labby. <laughs> yes, it does, Mr. Esposito. For the love of goodness. I don't know. Okay. Uh, I don't even know.
<laughs> yeah, I'm awake. Uh, I need to wake okay, up. Let's go that. to Mrs. Napoli. I'm the one that has to right, drive an hour. Or governess. Yeah. yeah, I know. I feel bad. I'm, we'll run through this next I'm one. I'm falling asleep. Anyway, on January 24th, the governance committee met, and during the meeting, we discussed the Strauss SMA Alert 229, which recommends the abolishment of two um, BOE policies, the Road Forward COVID-19 Health and Safety and the School Employee um, Vaccine Requirements. Um, we then reviewed seven of the 14 policies and regulations. The committee reviewed and made recommendations for the um, 20, uh, 2024 to 25 school district calendar. And we then began discussing on how we will execute the motion to name the Sayreville War Memorial High School Music Suite after John Bon Jovi. And that's about it. Allison, great job. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? I'm going to get my seat moved. <laughs> <laughs> Seeing none, good job. Uh, student Achievement, Mr. Fernandez, sir. Thank you, thank you, Mr. President. Um, the Student Achievement Committee met on February 3rd. <coughs> we just discussed was uh, AR, which I'd like to thank Dr. Lavi, Dr. Shedliak, and Mr. Malloy for their vision and their leadership in this in, pi in, in attempting to pi uh, pilot this at our UES. Also, curriculum, which was discussed, and most of the things we already discussed in our agenda, so I'll go through it quickly. We discussed curriculum for sports entertainment, musical theater, and the great sub summer programs that we're able to, to continue. That was it. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Fernandez. <laughs> <laughs> I talked fast, too. Any Don't questions worry. for Eloy? No. Thank you, Mr. Fernandez. Let's go to Mrs. Bloom, please. Middle school school, middle school county. Okay. The only thing I have, of course, is the upcoming Unsung Heroes, which will be held on March 15th at Old Bridge High School, and Dr. Labby will find out if we've picked our students yet. <clears throat> I also want to mention that we had our security uh, committee meeting last night, and I'll just run through some of the topics that we discussed. I can't give you details, because then I'd have to kill you. <clears throat> Campus monitor update, job descriptions and training. We talked about update on safety and security protocols for the buildings, discuss um, the firm working dates for the phase one reunification drill. Um, updates on the recent security threats, which is that whole protocol from the government, the governor rather. Cybersecurity update, uh, Stop It Solutions, which deploys safety and wellness solutions. Threat assessment team update, communication systems update. And uh, I also asked the chief of police if he could do something about uh, the crossing by the park, and he said he would look into it. That's Thank it. you. Thank you, Mrs. Bloom. Appreciate that. Um, last but not least, uh, Sayreville South Amboy Rotary. Mr. Fernandez, please. Thank you again, Mr. President. The Rotary held a blood drive in South Amboy. We were able to collect 30 pints of blood. This will save over 90 lives. Second blood drive is scheduled for Sayreville late, later this year. On behalf of the Rotary, I would like to express my gratitude to one of our own alumni who's always selflessly, selflessly given back to our community, Chris Cuneo and his brother. The Cuneo brothers combined their passion for horror and their passion for helping others by organizing the first annual I Heart Horror event right here in Sayreville for a great cause, the Borrower Heart and Lung. This multifaceted event brought over 400 people. The event brought together various vendors, multiple bands, and also included a, spe a special guest, Brian O'Halloran from the TV show Clerks, all of whom came together for a great cause and raised over $6,000 for a great charity. In all the recent troubles our community has, has undergone, the Cunio brothers ma made our town proud by hosting this event, and I really want to thank them for that. I'd also like to thank Anthony Donofrio from a AJM Embroidery for graciously donating his services to this wonderful event. Lastly, the Rotary has been working with local businesses to generate awareness for the best coffee shop north of Miami, <laughs> the Bomber Cafe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We'd also like to give a special sh shout out to Meg Dwyer from Remax Realty for hosting their weekly meeting at the Bomber Cafe earlier today, which I think was part of the heavy traffic we saw there, at least at some point. <laughs> Great. That's it. Thank you very much. Doing a good job, those uh, rotary guys, huh? And try it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, I don't see anybody here. No, we're not. I don't see anybody <laughs> here. Uh, but I will open it up to the public. I will now close it to the public. And uh, Dr. Labby, if you would take us through your report, sir. Yes, and I'll be very brief. Uh, let's start with finance and infrastructure number two on page two. Yes. Very generous <laughs> donation. I vote yes. <laughs> of an interactive whiteboard depicting basketball court 
uh, from touchboards.com. It's for the Wilson School, so we greatly appreciate that. Number four, page two, uh, the annual uh, you know, DuPont paying for two of our teachers to go to the National Science Teachers Convention. We're incredibly thankful for our, our community partners for du from DuPont for giving us this opportunity yet once again. And then uh, we are asking you to prove numbers five through seven on page three, the purchase of five 54 seaters, uh, seat buses, two 29 seat buses, and one uh, wheelchair bus, um, which is a 20 passenger bus. Uh, so we're asking you to purchase in total uh, of, I believe, eight buses. Correct? Yeah? Good. Any questions on those or any other motions on finance and infrastructure? Nope. Seeing none. Student achievement. We're asking you to approve a new unified music course for next school year at the middle school. You can find that on page 11, that's number two. Number three, we're asking you to approve new revised, uh, actually revised and new curriculum guides. Grades nine through 12, sports and entertainment and marketing, which is, that's great. Grade five, science. Grade seven, musical theater. And grade six, theatrical arts. You can find all that on page 11. Any questions on student achievement? Moving on to governance. As Mrs. Napolitano said, we're asking you to approve the 2024-2025 school district calendar. Believe it or not, several parents have already reached out to me uh, wanting to know about that calendar so that they can go ahead and uh, plan accordingly their vacation. So um, there it is. Number three, which you can find in the addendum, uh, as Mrs. Napolitano talked to you about, we are asking you to abolish two policies they are all COVID-related policies that were driven by executive orders by the governor, including um, the controversial requirement to be vaccinated. So we're asking to abolish those policies. And finally, uh, oh, actually, any questions on governance? Nope. Nope. Moving on to personnel. Uh, we do have one of those bittersweet moments, two of them. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go back to those. But before that, numbers 11 and 12 and 27 through 28, which you can find on page 19 in the addendum, we're asking you to hire new certificated and non-certificated staff. Number 13, which you can find on page 20, we're asking you to approve transfer of non-certificated staff for this school year. So we are going to say goodbye to some beloved staff members who have been with us for quite a bit of time and have made an indelible impact on our students, staff, and the entire community, beginning with Lori Pekansky. In Mrs. Pekansky's retirement letter, <coughs> she wrote, as someone who grew up in Sayreville, and was educated here from kindergarten to high school graduation. Teaching in our district was a dream come true. As an educator within the Sayreville School District for 34 years, Lori has given her time and talents to the students and staff of our district. She began her career at the Arleth Elementary School where she taught kindergarten. During her time at Arleth, she also worked with third and fourth grade students. Lori's lessons were creative and she often used components of technology in her classroom. Her ease with technology many years ago made her the perfect fit to become the technology teacher when the upper elementary school opened in 2004. During her time at the Samsville Upper Elementary School, she has always been able to add, always been able to draw upon her work with kindergarten students as she provided technology opportunities and lessons to the preschool students when they were here at the upper elementary school. Lori has worked at the summer enrichment program as well as Camp Excel extended school year. In many of Lori's past observations, uh, evaluators noted her use of humor, technology, creativity, and music to help engage her students. Lori has established a good rapport with many of her students and their families over the year who love her dearly. Lori has been instrumental in assisting her colleagues in using and troubleshooting technology. She has been the go-to person for technology needs and has helped to develop the curriculum, program, and equipment used within the building. She has served as the web assistant at Arleth and at the Upper Elementary School, where she has helped to set up the school's social media account and promote events for the Upper Elementary School. In fact, she uh, took pictures and posted them today of me talking to the kids about Let the Children Lead. <laughs> Um, she has served on the SAMHSA Advisory Committee, the Pupil Assistance Committee, 
the district tech planning committee and has volunteered for other events such as the family reading nights, character education committee, literacy family nights, family technology night, read across America, and has provided technology professional de development for many teachers both in the upper elementary school and outside of it. When students advocated for a Minecraft after school club, Lori jumped in with both feet to make it happen for the students and has been a very popular after school club for many years after that. Yearly, she promotes the Hour of Code and continues to teach the students that, about internet safety uh, as well as safety using social media. She has served as a mentor and is always willing to lend a hand to her colleagues. Lori has enhanced the programs such as DARE or LEAD and our STEM, and she actually created the STEM showcase and quickly created a program and slideshow for it. Lori's creativity and enthusiasm has allowed many students to enjoy her classes and learn from this dedicated teacher. Arleth and the upper elementary school staff administration have been fortunate to work with Lori through these many years. While sharing her time and talent, we have all learned a little bit more because of Mrs. Bikansky's commitment. Upon her retirement, Lori looks forward to traveling, tapping into her creative nature, and doing new things. Lori, we hope you enjoy each new adventure in your retirement. Thank you for all that you have done for the students and staff of the Sayreville School District. Happy retirement. So on behalf of the students and staff of the Sayreville Public Schools, we wish Lori nothing but the very best in her retirement. We thank her for her outstanding service to our students, the SAMHSA Upper Elementary School, the Arla School, our school district, and the greater community. Angela Kirasau. Angela Kirasau has served the children of Sarahville for the past 16 years. She has worked as a substitute paraprofessional for four years before becoming a part-time paraprofessional. Mrs. Kirasau has had an excellent attendance, has had excellent attendance throughout the years and enjoys each day with her students and colleagues. She has volunteered her time to assist with character education programs and family science night. Mrs. Kiria Sal has also been an integral part of the extended school year program. In the classroom, Angela helps students focus and assist them in their behavioral needs. She also helps students to stay organized and reinforces skills taught in the classroom. She is always persistent in helping struggling learners and has established a good rapport with all her students that she has worked with. She is a kind, caring person that greets her students with a smile each and every day. Angela is a cooperative and team player. She is flexible in her assignments to meet the needs of her students, teachers, and of course the building. She works very closely with the teachers to make sh sure that she accommodates the needs of all of her students. The Samso Upper Elementary School has been fortunate to work with a dedicated in individual, one who puts the students first. She comes to work daily with a positive attitude always ready to do what she needs for the children. Her understanding of students with special needs has always allowed her students to grow in confidence. Again, just as Mrs. Bikansky, we wish Mrs. Angela Kiriasau a wonderful retirement. And on behalf of all of our students and staff, we thank her for her outstanding service and the impeccable manner in which she has represented our school district and this community. And on a personal note, uh, I did have the opportunity to work um, many years with them in Camp Excel, and um, they, they are just fabulous teachers and extraordinary people that uh, we're going to miss dearly, particularly me. And that's my report, Mr. Esposito. Okay, thank you very much. Quick, uh, anybody have any quick questions for the good doctor? <laughs> Seeing none. Uh, I have a, a motion, please, to accept. Our superintendent's report. I'll move. Second. Mrs. Bloom, Mr. Walsh. Roll call, please. Mrs. Bloom? Sorry. Yes. Mr. Callahan? Yes. Mr. Fernandez? Yes. Mrs. Napolitano? Yes. Mrs. Pavone? Yes. Ms. Pylock? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Mr. Walsh? Yes. And Mr. Esposito? Yes. And I think I have to open it up to the public for items pertaining to the district, but seeing no one here, I will now close that. Um, that's it. Make a motion to adjourn, people. I'll move. Mrs. Bloom? Second. Second. Uh, Ms. Napolitano. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. See you in a couple of weeks, guys. Happy Valentine's Day. Oh, thanks. You're welcome.